Okay, welcome to the June 16th, 2022 board meeting. My name is Sung Oh, president of the board. Before we convene, I would like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing pharmacy law. Where protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid fashion. As included on the agenda, members are participating in two different two public locations, one in Sacramento, one and the second location in San Diego. Members of the public may participate in person at either of these locations or via WebEx using the link provided on the agenda. Participants watching the webcast will only be able to observe the meeting. Information and instructions are posted on our website to join the WebEx as well as the webcast. As I facilitate this meeting, I will announce when we are accepting public comment. I have advised the meeting moderator to allot two minutes to each individual providing comments. As public comments are taken, I intend to first accept public comment from those individuals attending in person at the Sacramento location, followed by those individuals attending in person at the San Diego location, followed by those individuals participating via WebEx. I'd like to ask staff moderating the meeting to provide general instructions to members of the public participating via WebEx. Moderator? Thank you, Mr. Board President. Before we get started, I would like to remind board members and staff who are not speaking to mute their microphones during today's meeting. If background noise is detected as a result of unmuted microphones, I will mute those microphones. Uh, there are members of the public in the audience and meet and meeting minutes are being taken, so we ask that members and staff please identify yourselves before speaking. For purposes of today's meeting, when the board president opens public comment, members of the public who would like to provide public comment at our DCA headquarters location in Sacramento can approach the table and microphone at the front of the room. For those participating at our San Diego location, you can let the board or staff member at your location know that you wish to make a comment by raising your hand. When called upon, we ask that the board or staff member present provide commenters access to your microphone. For those joining us on WebEx, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer and hand raise features to facilitate public comment. When public comment is called, I will open the question and answer feature, which you will hear me refer to as the Q&A, and members of the public who wish to make comment can click on the Q&A icon, type the word comment in the text box, and click on the send button. To utilize the hand raise feature, simply click on the hand icon next to your name to raise your and lower your hand. Those who have called into the meeting can dial star three to raise and lower their hand. These instructions will be displayed on the screen during public comment. After we have taken public comment from our Sacramento and San Diego locations, I will then call on those in individuals requesting comment through WebEx. And I return the floor back to the board president. Thank you, Trisha. And before I take a roll call, I would like to welcome our new member, Jessica, Jesse Crowley, to the board. Dr. Crowley was recently appointed to the board as a pharmacist member who is a member of a labor union that represents pharmacists. Jesse, welcome. Thank you, Sung. Yes, thank you, Jesse. All right, so now I'd like to take a roll call to establish a quorum as included on the agenda. If a quorum of members is not present as part of my discretion, we will proceed as a committee. Members, as I call your name, please remember to open your line before speaking. I will start with members present in the Sacramento location, followed by members present in the San Diego location. So starting with Maria Serpa. Maria Serpa, present licensee member. Thank you, Maria. Jig Patel. Not here. Indira Cameron Banks is not here. Jesse Crowley. Jesse Crowley, present. Thank you. And Jose De La Paz. Jose De La Paz, present, member of the public. Thank you, Jose. Kula Koenig is not here. Ricardo Sanchez. Uh, Ricardo Sanchez, public member. Thank you, Ricardo. Nicole Tebow is not here. Uh, and I am here, licensee member. And Jason, are you here in San Diego? I am here, President L. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jason. Unfortunately, a quorum was not established, so we will proceed as a committee. I'd like to announce that in the event that the board does not have a quorum during the portion of the meeting consistent with the provisions of Business and Professions Code, Section 4309C, 
and the board's policy, a committee of the board will consider the petitions today. I will now open the meeting for public comments for items not on the agenda. I'd like to remind members of the public that you're not required to identify yourself, but may do so. I would also like to remind everyone that the board cannot take action on these items except to decide whether to place an item on a future agenda. Members, following review of the public comments for this agenda item, I will ask members to comment on what, if any, items should be placed on a future agenda. As a reminder, this agenda item is not intended to be a discussion, rather an opportunity for members of the board and members of the public to request consideration of an item for future placement on an agenda, at which time discussion may occur. And I will first open up public comments for individuals attending in person at the Sacramento location. I don't see anyone, and I will open for anyone in San Diego, Jason. No comment here. Okay, is there any public present in San Diego? We have Dr. Stephen Gray. Okay, all right. So uh, then moving on to WebEx moderator, we are ready for public comment in uh, WebEx. Thank you, Mr. Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel, so if any member of the public would like to make a comment, you may type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and send it to all panelists, or you may simply raise your hand. And that said, we do have some folks with raised hands, so um, I will give you permission to unmute yourself, starting with Ruth. And Ruth, just know that you have two minutes to speak, and I'll give you a 10-second uh, reminder. So Ruth, you should be, yep, there you go, you're unmuted. I was just trying to make sure I don't have a question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, our next raised hand is from Timothy Riffenberg. And Timothy, you should be able to unmute yourself. And you're unmuted. Good, good morning, honorable members of the board. Uh, my name is Tim Reifenberg. I'm a pharmacist with Savon Albertsons. Um, and I've been a pharmacist in California over 40 years. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. I'm here again um, now to address two different issues, um, SB 1442 and SB 362, um, and the violations of the board policies by retail corporations. As a member, as a California pharmacist and business owner for over 40 years, I speak with experience and as um, the voice for hundreds of younger pharmacists who are afraid to speak up in fear of retaliation. These pharmacist licenses are all being exploited and abused in the efforts of corporate America to reap bigger and bigger profits each year. The work conditions due primarily to uh, poor and insufficient staffing have put their licenses at risk on a daily basis and increases the liability because more and more mistakes are being made and unreported. This further um, jeopardizes the safety and welfare of the consumer and patients. Um, unfortunately, uh, during COVID, COVID has created a whole new court measure of corporate greed that has little concern for, staff, for the pharmacists and staff. It's now not because they can't afford to, it is because they don't have to, and, and they choose not to comply with regulations um, if it is not you know, just more profitable. Um, and, and because they're not really made to due to a lack of enforcement of these regulations by the board. Um, this isn't due to the fact that they're not, uh, they can't afford to. 10 uh, seconds. Okay, in closing then, uh, I will, I'd like to say that, uh, can we please get this on the next agenda? What can I, what can I do um, to help you, you uh, us accomplish this goal? And, and uh, 10 seconds are up. So we're moving on to the next request for comment, which is from uh, Trent Jeffries. So Trent, you should be able to unmute yourself. All right, we'll try that again. 
So Trent, you should see a prompt to unmute yourself. All right, Trent, uh, we, you're still muted. So, uh, perhaps you would like to type your comment in the Q and a panel. That's another option. Okay, so he did type uh, members of the board. Thank you for your time. My name is Trent Jeffries and I'm the CEO of then. I believe I believe. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Great. Uh, so, to save you the effort of reading, my two minutes begins. Members of the board, thank you for your time. My name is Trent Jeffries. I'm the CEO of VendorX. Our technology platform is defined as an automated patient dispensing system, an APDS. Some of your inspectors may know of us uh, be, through your approval process in the, uh, in the Los Angeles area where we're granted license number ADD2207. Uh, we we offer uh, uh, some of our products in over 12 states. However, our core uh, focus is on California. And in particular, we've had requests specifically to install our system in an airport. We recognize the current rules associated with an ADDS, wherein it can be placed and operated inside an enclosed building with a premises address at a location approved by the board, and further with an APDS, that states it may be located and operated in a medical office or other location where patients are regularly seen for purposes of diagnosis and treatment. We're all aware that telehealth locations, the diagnosis and treatment location is no longer defined, but meets where the patients are via technology. We feel it is advantageous for this growing patient base and our customers have again specifically requested on multiple occasions to be able to put an APDS where they are. In this particular request, uh, we have been asked uh, by many of our customers to put an APDS in an airport location. For this purpose, uh, to this end, we would request having this as an agenda item for the next board meeting. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Russell McKee and Russell, you should be able to unmute yourself. There Hi, you yeah, thank you. Uh, my my name is Russell McKee. I'm, I'm with Trent Jeffries and I'm not trying to double dip here. I just wasn't sure whether he was going to be able to to get in and, and share um, our, uh, our request publicly. So he's done that now and uh, we thank you for your consideration. I'll uh, step aside and, and let you uh, hear other requests. All right, this is moderator and I do not see any further requests for public comments. Shall I close the Q and A panel? Yes, please. Thank you, Trisha. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for all the comments. And then um, just a reminder members, we cannot take action on the public comment uh, because we do not have a quorum, but please let me know if there were any items you would like to include as a future agenda item also. Um, just uh, announcing that just a reminder, we are having a our standard of um, care meeting next week, as well as medication error reduction and workforce committee next week on Thursday. Um, so I think one of the gentlemen, I, I hope you can please come to that meeting next week. That will be very, um, I, I think, insightful. So. Then Maria, go ahead. Did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. This is Maria Serpa. I would uh, remind the board that the first item regarding uh, pharmacist complaints is on a future agenda item for the enforcement committee, where the staff is going to be reporting out on the outcome for those um, issues, and um, would suggest that the second issue be potentially added to a licensing committee agenda for future discussion. Okay, we will notate. All right, so next, moving on to the agenda item three, recognition and celebration of pharmacist license in California for 40 years and other recognition. Um, unfortunately, we do not have anyone that's uh, here, but uh, just a reminder that uh, 
we are re restarting this program. And so congratulations to everyone who has been a licensed pharmacist uh, for over 40 years. The board thanks you for your contribution to the public health. And I understand you can't always travel to Sacramento. So, uh, but you can join virtually, we'll still recognize you. So please uh, come and celebrate yourself for all that accomplishment. Okay, so we're moving um, on to agenda item five. As we do not have currently have a quorum, we are going to take agenda out of order. We will begin with petitions for reinstatement of licensure, early terminations, or other modification of penalty, consistent with the provisions of Business and Professions Code section 4309C and the board's policy. As a quorum of the board is not present, a committee of the board will consider the petitions today and make recommendations to take to the full board that will be subject to review by the full board in accordance with government code section 11517. If we obtain a quorum later in the meeting, I will make that announcement and petitions heard after a quorum is established will be decided by the majority of the members later in closed session. I would like to turn the meeting over to ALJ Jessica Wall to preside over the hearings. Judge, are you here? President O, this is uh, Jason in, in San Diego. Are Hello, we, Jason. Are we not addressing item four? Item four will be brought back uh, once we have a quorum. That has to be during a quorum. Okay, thank you. Yes, yep. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, we do have guests here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, President O. Before we go on the record, I just wanna make sure that we have everyone we need present. And we're gonna be starting with Ms. Is it Urasova? Could you please pronounce your name for me? Katarina Urasova. Urasova. Good morning, Ms. Urasova. And our Deputy Attorney General, is it Ms. Trama? Is that correct? That's correct. Trama. Okay. Trama. Got it. Um, okay. So is there anything we need to address before beginning with these petitions this morning? Ms. Urasova, are you representing yourself today? Yes, I am. Thank okay, you. thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Um, okay, just so everyone knows, we are going to be electronically recording these hearings because we do not have a court reporter present. So if you see me looking down or if I have any audio problems on my end, I will need to pause us because my audio is what is making this recording. So I just wanted to make that note first. And with that, we will begin. Good morning. We are on the record today before the Board of Pharmacy Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California. Today, we will be reviewing six petitions. This, um, will all members of the board please identify themselves? And if I could have President O do a roll call, that would help me as I cannot clearly see everyone virtually. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna start here with uh, Maria Serpa. Here. Thank you, Maria. Um, Jesse Crowley. Here. Thank you, Jesse. Jose De La Paz. Present. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Ricardo Sanchez. At present. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, and I am here and in San Diego, Jason Wise. I'm here. Thank you, Jason. Back to you, Your Honor. Thank you. So my understanding is that we do not have a quorum of the board present and we will be hearing this matter by a committee of the board under Business and Professions Code Section 4309, Subdivision C, which will be subject to board review under Government Code Section 11517. My name is Jessica Wall. I'm an Administrative Law Judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter. The first matter we will be hearing today is the petition for early termination filed by Katrina Urasova, Agency Case Number 4829, OAH case number 20220060194. May I please take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Deputy Attorney General Nicole Trauma. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General for the people of the state of California under Government Code Section 11522. 
Thank you, Ms. Trauma. May I please have the petitioner state and spell her name for the record? Katerina Yurasova. Thank you, Ms. Yurasova. Could you please state or uh, spell your name for the record? First name's K-A-T-E-R-I-N-A. -E Last name is Yurasova. U R A S O V A. Thank you very much, Ms. Yurasova. So, would you prefer the title of Ms. Yurasova or Dr. Yurasova in this matter? Uh, Dr. Yurasova. Thank you, Dr. Yurasova. So, in this hearing, the board is concerned with any rehabilitation that you have undergone since your license is disciplined. The Deputy Attorney General, Ms. Trauma, will go first presenting the petition packet and a background of the matter. After that, I will swear you in and you'll have an opportunity to make your presentation. I'd like to remind you that the board has had the benefit of reading the petition package and you don't have to re repeat all the material in that package. After you testify, you'll be subject to questioning by the board and Ms. Trauma. After day today's hearing, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. You will not receive a decision today. It will be mailed in the near future. Do you have any questions, Dr. Yurisova? No, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Trauma, could you please present the petition summary? Good morning, Your Honor. I'll present a summary of the case and then I'll mark for identification the petition packet and the related documents. We're here today on a petition for early termination of probation. The underlying accusation alleged petitioner violated laws and regulations governing the practice of pharmacy. A board investigation revealed that while she was the pharmacist in charge at Century Discount Pharmacy, she failed to retain records of acquisition and disposition, violated corresponding responsibility laws, committed dishonest acts, failed to have a completed self-assessment available for inspection, furnished drugs without a prescription, and unlawfully refilled prescriptions and billing fraud. The violations in the uh, underlying accusation occurred um, in 2015. Effective July 10th, 2018, a petitioner's pharmacist license was revoked, the revocation was stayed, and the license was placed on probation for six years. The decision required her license to be suspended until she completed the DEA uh, Board of Pharmacy Joint Training on Prescription Drug Abuse. She completed it prior to the effective date, so her license was never suspended. Petitioner has complied with quarterly reporting, has not supervised interns or acted as a PIC, a designated rep or consultant. She's paid the costs associated with probation monitoring, has complied with her community service requirement and her remedial education requirements, as well as the ethics court course. She also has only practiced under the supervision of a licensed pharmacist in good standing and has not owned any licensed premises. Her probation was told for approximately seven months because she was not able to meet the minimum work requirement. It was told from July to November 2018 for five months, one month in July 2019, and one month in March of 2020. She was also ordered to pay uh, $16,740 in costs. She has a remaining balance of $10,450. In addition, she has not paid an administrative penalty in the amount of $2,000 for each year of probation. Petitioner is requesting to terminate probation early. With her instant petition, she has submitted uh, continuing education certificates taken from November 2019 through July 2021, submitted seven letters of recommendation, and all of those have been verified. She also submitted a personal statement. I'd now like to mark as Exhibit 1 the petition packet. This includes all of the documents that I just outlined. Um, that were attached to the packet, including the uh, notice of hearing and the memorandum to the board and the underlying decision in order. The board members and petitioner have been provided with a copy of the same petition and a redacted petition was uploaded to the OAH system, Bates labeled AGO 001 through AGO 222. It is now petitioner's opportunity to address the board. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Yurisova, I'd like to ask you if you have any, any any objections to me admitting the petition package marked Exhibit 1 into evidence. I don't have any objections. Thank you. Petition packet will be admitted as Exhibit 1 for all purposes. 
Now, Dr. Yurisova, I'm going to swear you in so I can consider your testimony as evidence, as may the board, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do swear. Thank you, Dr. Yurisova. So this is now your opportunity to testify about why you have petition the board to terminate your probation early. You don't need to ask yourself questions. The board and Ms. Trauma will ask you questions after you've provided your initial statements. Thank you. And good morning again, honorable judge, members of the board and other listeners of this meeting. First of all, I would like to thank you to present for allowing me to present my petition for the possibility of early termination of my probation. I know that petitions are granted sparingly and only to the pharmacist who demonstrated the re rehabilitation. I'm here being today in shame and regret about my past actions. I'm going to go quickly over my story. I'll tell you what I learned, how I remediated, and hopefully you can see that I've made significant changes to, for you to consider my early termination. So in 2005, I graduated from Western University of Health Sciences with a PharmD degree. After that, I decided to proceed and continue on my personal development. And I successfully com completed the general pharmacy practice residency at Cedar sinai Medical Center. That became my home for the, for the next 12 years. By training, I'm a clinical pharmacist, and most of my career, I, I worked at the hospital environment. I floated through the different areas of the Cedar sinai Medical Center. I was involved in personal interactions with the patients. I was part of the multidisciplinary team. For the past several years, I was working in a perioperative area. What I love the most is the direct interactions with the healthcare providers. My team was my nurses, my technicians, surgeons, anesthesiologists, surgical techs. We all provided the patient with the best possible care at the most vulnerable time when the patients were during the surgery. My job was I could ever ask for. My job was challenging and rewarding at the same time. When I entered my profession, I never thought I would be in this situation that I am today. I'm begging for mercy after making very bad judgment calls. About years, eight years ago, I let my judgment lapse badly. I accepted I thought was the only temporary position of the PIC at the private community pharmacy. And clearly I was not ready for this. I didn't have an experience. I, I had already full-time commitment to my hospital job. And I just came out of the maternity leave with a little child on my hands. I understand there is no excuse for my behavior. Now I know that PIC is responsible for all of the operation of the pharmacy, responsible for the compliance with laws and regulations at the pharmacy. Even PIC is not on premises, it is still his or her responsibility. Even though I was not directly involved in the misconduct that led to my discipline, I accept the responsibility for my failure to meet the standards at which PACs are being held. And what troubles me the most about my past conduct is my negligence contributed to the diversion of the controlled substances from the Century Discount Pharmacy. I know the opioid crisis is a still a public threat. And as a mother of three children, I am terrified by the thought that the drugs that were diverted from the century, century discount pharmacy could have harmed a child. As a pharmacist, I have responsibility to safeguard the drug supply 
and I'll be thinking about this mistake for the rest of my life. I'm still grateful for the Board of Pharmacy that I was given the opportunity to practice as a pharmacist. I started my remediation journey in July 2018. As you know, it, it is very difficult to find a job with a probational license. I was lucky enough to become a part of a team at the Clinica Romero, which is a federally qualified care center that takes care of the underprivileged patients. I've been working there for about three years with no monetary compensation. I'm very grateful for this experience. I was allowed to be part of this multidisciplinary team of the physicians, nurse practitioners, social worker, pharmacies, pharmacists, pharmacy technician, and clerks to provide the best possible care for the patient who is in the most vulnerable state. I developed so much in my knowledge about the primary care. My pharmacy team was the best. And I'm clearly thankful for this experience. In October 2021, I was lucky enough to get hired at a full-time position at Long-Term Care Pharmacy, Premier Pharmacy Services, as a, for the evening and night shifts. At this pharmacy, I had an opportunity to furnish controlled substances, including C2. I was responsible for reconciliation of the narcotic, narcotics. I was responsible for investigating any discrepancies happening to narcotics and reporting to the PIC. I also took part of the reviewing the methadone policy. The conduct that led to my discipline happened about eight years ago, and I had plenty of time to work on my mistakes and learn from them. I took ethics courses that helped me to identify my vulnerabilities and show me how to recognize the early signs of the boundary violation. Since December of 2017 up to now, I continuously participate in a conference calls called Maintenance and Accountability Seminars, where I learn from other professionals' experiences how they violated boundaries, and I also share my experience of doing that and how I remediate and how I understand better the roots of my issue. I also took um, CE courses related to the pharmacy operation and handling of narcotics, about 20 hours of the mandatory CEs, and I also did about 92 hours of the general continuous education courses. I took recently the board certified pharmacotherapy exam specialist, and I'm waiting for the results. I had the chance to volunteer I volunteer at the local hospital. I also had a chance to volunteer to immunize patients at the county ev event um, with COVID-19 vaccine. I also educate, educate the central Los Angeles community about the use of the medications for diabetes mellitus. The discipline of my license had given me the opportunity to reshape how I practice today and to better understand that pharmacists must focus not only on the clinical aspect of my profession, but also I have to be updated and knowledgeable about the regulatory issues. Right now, I have clear understanding of the duties and responsibilities of pharmacists in charge. Although I don't plan to take on such position in the future, I believe I'm capable to practice pharmacy safely, responsibly, without any restrictions. And I realize the board and the public put a tremendous trust in pharmacists, and I failed it when I was acting as PIC. I hope I will be able to regain the trust through my remediation. 
and I offer you my humble apology for my mistakes, along with my firm commitment to go above and beyond mayor compliance in the future. And the lessons that I have learned from my discipline will stay with me for the rest of my life. And I can assure you that I will not allow similar mistakes to happen again. And in fact, when I speak with my colleagues, I often bring the example of what not to do. I want others to learn from my mistakes. During past four years, I also acquired two valuable mentors. One of them is my manager from my hospital job. And the other one, to my surprise, it was a board inspector of pharmacy. They both provided me the support and guidance. They both believe that I, if I'm honest, persistent, and keep myself updated with the, all the clinical knowledge, with all laws and regulations, I have a hope to regain the trust of the public, to regain the trust of my colleagues and the board. I can become the best version of myself. And you may ask me, why do we need to grant your petition? I can assure you that my commitment and my rehabilitation are real. And I'm asking for relief because I believe that my skills are underutilized at this time of the unprecedented public health crisis. Healthcare resources are being stretched, and my current probationary status effectively deprives the public of my service because it's very hard to hire someone like me with a restricted license. I am ready and I'm willing to serve the public as a pharmacist and as I promised in my off of pharmacist. And I sincerely hope you will change your mind. At this point, again, I served about four years of the probation in compliance. I took ethic courses. I updated my knowledge. I stay updated on the laws and regulations. And I sincerely believe that the interest of public health would be served well by terminating my probation at this time. I know to serve, to serve the public, it's a privilege that was given to me by the Board of Pharmacy. And that must be earned. And I sincerely hope that I will, you will grant me this privilege again. Thank you for con your consideration. And now I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Yurisova. While we're on the record, I'd like to just double check. Are there any additional documents you would like to be submitted as part of your petition? Um, no, not at this point. Thank okay. you. Are there any witnesses that you wish to call on behalf of your petition? No. Thank you. So now I'm going to check with President O. Oh. President O, oh, would you prefer the board members ask questions first or Ms. Trauma? I think we usually do Ms. Trauma first. So go ahead and we'll go with uh, Dan Trauma and then we'll go for the board members. Thank you. Ms. Trauma, will you please begin? Thank you, Your Honor. Now, you were the pharmacist in charge at Century Discount Pharmacy which was where the violations and the accusation occurred, correct? Yes, it is. I and was... looking back, thank you. Looking back on it now, um, did you understand the responsibility that went with being a pick at the time that you agreed to take on that role? Right now, I have a clear as ever understanding of the PIC responsibilities, meaning that PIC is responsible for all of the operations of pharmacy, all, all the compliance with the laws and regulation, even 
if the PIC is not on premises. Do you feel like mm -hmm. at the time that you were, uh, that you decided to take on that role as PIC, that you were ready for that? I was, I was not ready. No. Um, right now I am thinking back and I see that I was not ready. If you ask me right now, yes, I was not ready. Clearly not ready. At this time, I don't remember what I was thinking, but I did what I did and I deeply regret that I failed. So at the time that you took on the role as PIC, you were actually working full-time as a clinical pharmacist somewhere else, right? I was on maternity leave uh, with my third child. It was the end of the maternity leave. And then, yes, this is what happened. I did not want to leave my full-time job um, at the hospital. I had commitment with a full-time job at the hospital. Okay. Um, and all of your experience was in as a clinical pharmacist in that hospital setting, correct? Yes, that is correct. And Century Discount Pharmacy was a retail setting? Uh, private community pharmacy, yes. Do you believe that most of the reason you got into trouble related to you not understanding retail pharmacy and the responsibilities of being a pick of a retail pharmacy? I think so, yes. I Because nothing can, because um, I think the experience is the most valuable part of um, being PIC or be specializing in any other areas. You know the details, but in my case, it was not. It was not. Um, it, it was not the case. I. I was not ready for that role. When you were pick at Century, um, were you actually working there? Were you there at the pharmacy? Oh, I was not there full time. No, because I started working. I, I went back to my original job. Okay. To my so, understanding, it was just a temporary um, position to help my ex friend. Um, is that ex friend the one that you mentioned in your petition, pharmacist Narani? Yes. Okay. Um, and did you have any ownership in Sentry? No. Okay. And why wasn't this pharmacist Narani pharmacist in charge instead of you? I I never questioned that because I think I'm responsible for my own actions. I I learned not to point fingers. I don't know why she was not charged. Um, one of the allegations against you was for dishonesty mm -hmm. based on a statement you made to the board about being a pick and then later a statement that you said you weren't the pick. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us what happened with that? I know that I misinformed the Board of Pharmacy, but honestly, I don't know what I was thinking this time. I know it was not the smartest decision that I made or I said. I cannot rationalize that. And if you would ask me, would I do it again? Absolutely not. Do, do you ever see yourself becoming a pharmacist in charge again? I am not planning to take on this role in the near future. I cannot guarantee, but I'm not planning to take over. But, but the thing is, I, for the past four years, I learned what pharmacists in charge, what are the pharmacists in charge duties and responsibilities. And I do have a clear understanding of all of the responsibility that the pharmacist in charge is in, you know, uh, held responsible, uh, held accountable for. So 
again, I'm not planning, but um, I am completely different in uh, person right now. I, I have more knowledge. I'm more up to date with laws and regulations. So I, um, I can, I don't really want to, but I think I can take over that position if I have to. Uh, is there anything you would tell new pharmacists who are considering taking on a role as a PIC? First of all, to find the mentor or the person who has an experience in this area and so they can talk and give in, ins and outs about those, this you know, role. Of course, review the law part and go over the um, responsibility of the pharmacist in charge. And um, I definitely tell them to work first in this area, let's say if it's a retail setting, work there and then become pharmacy in charge, but not straight out of school. That would be not a good idea. Okay. Along with your packet, you had submitted a log of jobs that you had applied for. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Did you have a hard time finding a job as a pharmacist while on probation? Yes. So for um, from 2018 up to 2021, that's the log of um, of the um, job that I had applied for. I had interviews. I had interviews, um, but. Usually my, at the end of the interview, I reveal the fact that my license is on probation and um, most of the time I never got my phone call back. Uh, there were a couple of, um, one, of one of the interviews, um, it was with a private pharmacy. She, was, she wanted to hire me, but she could not provide me the level of supervision that I was at. The other example was I applied to Luther Mar Martha King Hospital and the uh, PIC of the pharmacy was agreeing to take me, to offer me employment, but um, the pharmacy was, um, was employed through the Cardinal Health and Cardinal Health did not give a green light. So your probation was told for about seven months due to you not being able to meet the work requirement, correct? Yes, at the beginning, um, I could not find a job at all where I can practice as a pharmacist. So in November, 2018, I found the place where I can practice. And I did for about three years. It was unpaid position. Right, um, during that time, oh. Excuse me, go ahead. Um, and there was, I think, a couple of months when my PIC went on a vacation and I, I failed to um, catch that. So I couldn't show up anymore because I needed that level of supervision. And, you know, she was, she went on vacation. And I think during the pandemic period as well, I lost a couple of, a month, I think. Um, that I didn't meet my 40 hours uh, per month. As a result of uh, not being in a paid position, did you have a hard time paying the costs associated with your probationary case? Unfortunately, yes. I was lucky enough my husband was working, but um, yes, unfortunately, I have three children. Unfortunately, we lost, we suffered some you know, um, budget loss due to my inability to work. Um, again, um, I don't blame anyone. It was my responsibility. Um, it just, um, I just wanted to make sure my kids' welfare remain intact. That's why I asked for the board to make some arrangement with me to pay some minimal amount of money until I'm gonna get an employment. So I was paying about $140 a month. And then I started to uh, pay more when I um, got employed. 
Okay, and the employment that you're just you're referring to is a paid position that started in October of 2021. Yes, it was. Okay, and um, can you explain to the board why you haven't been able to pay off the remaining balance of your costs? I started paying right now about six hundred dollars a month to cover for my cost. Um, but I, uh, if necessary, I will uh, start, um, you know, paying more, definitely, and uh, I, I, I'm willing to uh, borrow the rest of the sum that I own and pay off um, everything completely. Are you hoping to terminate probations so that you'll have more work-related opportunities? Definitely, yes, definitely. I, I know that I'm going to have more work opportunities and I can't wait that I, I'm able to work as a clinical pharmacist. You stated in your petition that your understanding of the pharmacist's oath and the pharmacy law is clear as never before. What did you mean by that? I, since I, what happened to me eight years ago, I, uh, I have this off of pharmacy pharmacist that I carry with me in my backpack. And I, right now, I understand the seriousness and how much trust the public and the Board of Pharmacy puts into us as a pharmacist. And this feeling and understanding gives me that pride of being pharmacist and pride in what I do, how I can serve the public, how I can take care of the patient. Because when I practiced for so many years, I kind of was focused only on my clinical aspect of pharmacy job and, you know, how to take care of the patient and forgot that there is a, you know, pharmacy law part of the practice that I really need to be updated. And there are some promises that I have to be following throughout my career and beyond that I promised when I got that license, when I got trusted by the Board of Pharmacy to take care of the patients. So right now it's clear as never before. What would you say um, was aspect of probation would be the biggest impact on you? First of all, again, I strengthen my connection with the Board of Pharmacy. I read emails that being sent. I visit regularly the Board of Pharmacy website. I read script. I also gained different experience uh, from different pharmacy settings. I worked at the FQHC clinic, clinic where, again, I never experienced that um, environment in my life, it was very valuable. I learned more about the primary care. I learned how the team, again, is working together with the minimal resources to provide the best care for the patients. I had an experience in long-term care pharmacy. I also worked in that you know, environment. So, and I met so many new people uh, in my life that gave me a little bit of their intake of understanding of the profession of the pharmacy. And also I have, I, I got a new two um, mentors that again, show me that this is important. I have to be honest. I have to be persistent. I have to keep myself updated with the laws and regulations on top of my clinical knowledge. I took those ethics courses where I 
clearly saw that I need to work on that vulnerability to see the, the, the clear line between personal and professional relationships. Also, how to recognize the early signs of the boundary violation. I've been on those phone calls that opened my eyes for the past, what, seven, three plus, for the past almost five years on how it's easy to violate the boundary. And, um, and there are other people like me, but we learn from each other. So we're not, it's not gonna happen anymore. And with this knowledge and experience that I acquired, I can share it with other people so they don't get into the same trouble that I did. Thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Ms. Troma. President O, oh, would you please poll the board for their questions? Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. I will start here with Ms. Uh, Dr. Maria Serpa. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Thank you, Dr. Rosova. I appreciate your, your testimony and I read your package uh, is a uh, very compelling story. But one part that you didn't talk about today, and I'm hoping that you could uh, answer, is why would you be involved with a already troubled pharmacy as PIC and not be physically present there? Um, how did that happen? And um, why did you go down that rabbit hole? I knew the pharmacist who worked there full time. I knew him since the time when I came to this country. We together took classes in pharmacy school and I was, I knew his, um, a little bit of his life story. Um, I don't know what I was thinking back then. Maybe it just were sleepless nights with my newborn, the third one, or I don't know, maybe I'm trying to find excuses, but um, I, thought I guess I was trying to help him at this time. I don't know if it sounds right or not, but I think that was my thought back then. Um, and, and he couldn't be pharmacist in charge at that time, he told me, uh, because it was hard for him to find another job. And um, he was asking me for help. But again, I uh, that's the, that's where I see I violated that boundary between personal and professional relationship. This clearly, I see myself failing right there. And again, if you ask me, would I do it again? Absolutely not. But right now I'm different person because I learned about the duties and responsibility of PIC and I see the clear picture of what is expected from the PAC to protect the public and provide the service for the patients. Thank you for your honesty and for your time. No further questions. Thank you, Dr. Sherpa. Okay, and then uh, we'll go with Dr. Jesse Crowley. Have any questions for petitioner? Hello, um, thank you so much for presenting today. I know it's not easy to come in front of the board. So I first of all commend you for your bravery and vulnerability speaking with us today. I do have a few questions of clarification. So I know we touched upon it a few times, but do you have an idea of the number of hours on average per week you were at each respective facility? So at your hospital job and at the, the community setting? I apologize, is this question being referred to me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I apologize. Um, um, so you were asking um, how many hours I... Uh, yes, how many hours were you working in the hospital and then how many hours were you working in the community pharmacy at the time that the violations occurred? 
I just want to get an idea of how many hours you were working per week. I cannot tell. I don't remember exactly how many hours because right now I it's been about eight years and and I'm uh, kind of blinking out. Uh, I know that I started working full time when I came out of from maternity leave. I unfortunately did did not spend that much time at the pharmacy. I. I, I'm afraid to tell you the wrong number. Um, That's okay. But it wasn't. It was not full time. It was less than part time for sure. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions. So, I did go through your extensive list. I see that you've been trying very hard to to get a pharmacy job. Um, a lot of the the pharmacies that you've been applying to are also retail jobs. So. I'm just wondering in, in curiosity if probation were to be lifted off your license, ideally what setting would you like to be practicing in? Ideally, I would like to combine my administrative job plus part-time in, in the hospital setting. That's my, that's my goal. Okay, thank you. And then the final question, I just want to, uh, I'm not sure if you remember, but mm -hmm. Do you have um, any insight into what your life was like? I know you said you had just come back from maternity. This was your, your third kid at the time that the, these violations came on and, and that you took on this PIC role. Can you describe what your life was like outside of work? Just a, a little bit. With three children. <laughs> um, At this time, I, uh, when I uh, had my third child, I um, was not in a very good emotional state. Um, first of all, somehow I got anemic during my pregnancy and I got um, blood transfusions. When I came home, I still didn't feel well. It was very tough on me, the last um, pregnancy. I don't want to diagnose myself, but I feel I had some kind of a postpartum depression because I was in a very, I don't know, miserable state that I clearly remember. I was a very unhappy person. I, again, I don't know a lot of reasons why, but that's how I remember those days where I was very unhappy, tired, and um, emotionally drained and physically as well. I, because as I don't know if any, I'm sure some of you have children and with, when it's just a newborn, I, I, I didn't sleep well. I was sleep deprived, so it was not the physically, it was not the best situation for me and emotionally. Great. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Okay. We're going to go to Jose. I have no questions at this time, Mr. President. Thank you, Jose. And then, uh, Ricardo, any questions for Dr. Yersova? I'd like to, um, so we can hear me now. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming for the board, and um, just want you to know that uh, eight years, you know, have passed. We do believe in redemption here in this board, and um, applaud you for your volunteer work at the local hospital, and um, you know, paying back your debt minus the ten thousand. But you know, I'm I'm, I'm seeing that the last eight years you you've been. Uh, do what you have to do to uh, get back on board. And I wanted to applaud you for that. It takes a lot of courage to come before the board and um, wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Jason? Thank you, President O. Hi, Dr. Yurasova. I do have no questions, but I wanted to second board member Sanchez's comments. Uh, I really do appreciate 
uh, the effort and work that you put in. Uh, definitely, definitely want to uh, say redemption is possible. And I think that you have done a tremendous amount of work and I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I have just one clarifying question. I think everything else has been asked. Uh, on your work now, Dr. Yusova, do you work now or are you really more like volunteering at a clinic? I have an administrative job at USC School of Pharmacy and I also remain on the per diem position in long-term care pharmacy, um, premier pharmacy help, premier pharmacy services. Okay, and what do you do at the school? I'm sorry, could you just clarify that? I coordinate students on rotations. Okay. I help to coordinate them on rotations. And if they have some issues, I try to help. And um, if they need a little more guidance on their projects, I also help them as well. Okay, great. All right, that's it for me. I don't have any further questions. Back to you, Your Honor. Thank you, President Bao. So, Dr. Yurisova, this is your opportunity. If there's anything else that you would like the board to know before they issue their decision, feel free to share it now. I would like to emphasize that, again, I am deeply, deeply sorry for my misconduct in the past and I am a different professional right now. I am again clear on all of the expectations from the board. So I need to serve the public and I am committed to maintain the high principles of moral, ethical and legal conduct throughout my career and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yurisova. So that concludes the petition hearing in this matter. The case is submitted and the record is closed. We are off the record in this matter and we'll proceed to the next petition. Thank you. Thank you. So, Your Honor, we apologize. So we're gonna to have to take some things out of order. So we're actually going to go back to the agenda during our board meeting. So if you could just hold off on a little bit and sorry, uh, DAC trauma. We're gonna go back to agenda item four. So sorry, everyone, just a little unforeseen circumstances come up. So now we have a quorum. So we're gonna go back to agenda item four. Oh, we're gonna take a look, yeah. So going back to agenda item four, discussion and consideration of Senate Bill 958, LIMO Medication and Patient Safety Act of 2022. As we have a quorum, we're gonna go pivot back to prior agenda item four and consider Senate Bill 958 for purposes of the record. We're gonna take a roll call. So Maria. Maria Serpa, present licensee member. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Jesse Crowley. Jesse Crowley, present. Thank you, Jose De La Paz. Jose De La Paz, present, member of the public. Thank you, Jose Kula Koenig. Kula Koenig, present, member of the public. Thank you, Kula. Ricardo Sanchez. Uh, Ricardo Sanchez, public member. Thank you, Ricardo and Jason Wise. Jason Wise, public member. Thank you, Jason, and I'm here. The quorum is established. Okay, so as we begin our discussion on this measure, I'd like to advise members that this measure is being considered in advance of the July board meeting, just in case the board wants to offer amendments. The board has also received written comments on the measure. Further, the appropriations committee analysis is now available, which is included in the meeting material. As I stated at the beginning of the meeting, the board is a consumer protection agency Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. In my opinion, the practice of both brown bagging and white bagging is a payer-driven practice that is in direct conflict with the board's consumer protection mandate. As we proceed today, 
I'd like to remind members that the public is allowed to participate in the process as with any discussion we consider public comment received. We do need to remain mindful that opinions presented are just that opinions. It is incumbent, incumbent upon us to collectively consider any matter and ultimately make a decision consistent with our mandate. This is not always easy as there are times when such a decision involves complex issues and or competing interests. Having said that, I am going to start my comments by offering a motion to establish a supportive amended position on Senate Bill 958, which is consistent with the Legislation and Regulations Committee recommendation following its April 2022 meeting. Included as part of the recommendation was to offer amendments regarding costs as well as provisions to prohibit a vendor from providing services for white bagging should a number of violations of provisions occur. Member Senate Bill 958 addresses two types of payer-driven practices, white bagging and brown bagging. Brown bagging refers to the dispensing of a medication from a pharmacy, typically a specialty pharmacy, directly to a patient who then transports the medications to a physician's office or other site for administration. White bagging refers to the distribution of patient-specific medication from a pharmacy, typically a specialty pharmacy, to the physician's office or other location for administration. In a report published in April 2018 by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, the practice of white bagging is often used in oncology practices to obtain costly injectable or infusible medications that are distributed by specialty pharmacies and may not be available in all non-specialty pharmacies. In its report, NABP detailed concerns with this business practice. The medications are often patient-specific and require special handling and can thus pose safety, operational, and unexpected financial burdens. Additionally, medication delivered directly to the patient through the brown bagging model may not have been correctly stored and handled, which can affect the drug, drug's efficacy and safety. And AVP also noted that in some instances, patients participating in white bagging or brown bagging programs often require therapy modification. Change of dosage or strength or transition to a different class of medications is common. When changes to medication therapy occurs, it often leads to excessive waste because the previously dispensed medication cannot be reused for a different patient. And ABP noted medication delivered through the mail may arrive late or damaged. The information included in NABP's report is consistent with information learned during the Enforcement and Compounding Committee's informational hearing on white bagging. As included in the minutes from that meeting, members received numerous presentations and comments describing the patient safety concerns presented through white bagging. Comments included that some of these medications are sensitive to temperature and light fluctuations and require special handling and storage to maintain efficacy. These medications often have serious and debilitating chronic conditions such as cancer, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's, and very importantly, rare diseases where delays in therapy can be catastrophic. Further, members were advised that due to the severity of conditions and complexity of treatment, drugs and doses must often be modified at the point of care based on patient-specific conditions including weight, renal function, bone marrow function, lab results, etc. These modifications can easily be addressed when medication supplies are managed by the physician's office, hospital, or clinic. Patient-specific examples were also provided. As an example, a patient experienced a two-week delay in their already well-established treatment plan because of the mandatory transition to a specialty pharmacy. Once this issue was resolved, the patient experienced an additional one-week delay because some of the drugs had to be mixed, but the specialty pharmacy was not able to supply the drugs or the pump required to infuse the medication. Members also learned about the specific impact to pediatric patients, including delays in therapy. It was noted that some infusions for pediatric patients are one lifetime chance for the patient where there is one chance to get treatment. If the drug is not stored and handled properly, that one lifetime chance could be lost. Members were advised there are numerous stories where therapy was significantly delayed due to logistics, including delayed deliveries, lost shipments, dispensing of drugs expiring prior to the patient procedures, all of which negatively impacts the patient and their families. I could continue on detailing out the negative impacts of patients 
But I think it is clear the risk to patients is not a theoretical one, it is real. So Senate Bill 958 seeks to address many of these issues by prohibiting the practice of brown bagging and placing important guardrails around the practice of white bagging. I believe a supportive amended position is appropriate given that SB 958 deals with both brown bagging that has significantly more safety and handling issues as well as white bagging. And thank you for your patience while I provided my thoughts on the issue in support of my motion. Um, in support of my motion. So I'm hoping uh, open the discussion to other members and would welcome a second on my motion if you believe the motion is appropriate. Members? Oh, just a second. I'll, I'll second that. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, any member discussion? Hi, it's Maria Serpa. Uh, I totally support the motions on the table. This was uh, discussed in depth in the uh, Enforcement and Compounding Committee with multiple presentations and uh, support the motion going forward. Okay, any other members? I just have a question. Um, is there an alternative to white bagging and or brown bagging? I don't know if I'm the Berea, do you have any? I think that our um, um, public member that's gonna make a presentation can speak to that right now. But as, it's, as it stands now, uh, that it, this is something that can be required of, of providers or insurances companies, and the uh, healthcare providers are have their hands tied. So this bill is to untie their hands. It's, if I probably stated that incorrectly, but um, I think our presentation will answer your question. And it's a, just a public comment, not a presentation. So it's it's just, uh, I think we have a public comment here in Sacramento who would like to address some of the concerns. So, so with the motion and second, I'm gonna go for public comment and I think we're ready for that now. So go ahead, uh, Dr. Shane. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O, members of the board, and actually the, the, the uh, privilege of being here. I actually am one of the over 40 year pharmacists. I just- Oh, congratulations. I'm over 40. Um, years of really being obsessed with patient safety um, and in, answer, in response to the question. The current practice in, in, in health systems and cancer clinics is that the drugs are, are stocked and readily available. So the doses that are, um, and the drugs that are prescribed are then pulled off the shelf of the inventory, just as it would be in any pharmacy and made just in time based on data that is available regarding the patient's current condition. With, with cancer and some of the disease states that were mentioned, uh, patients. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to answer the question. I apologize. Okay, and I know I have two minutes, so I'm going to try to be, um, be, be be mindful and respectful of that. So, uh, so in the in organizations, we we um, we check the patients on a daily basis um, prior to their treatment and to make sure that there haven't been any changes that would uh, result in a need for a dose change, as you said. But I wanted to just set the stage quickly, and, and it's really about complexity, right? The, the, the nature of the drugs that, that the payers are now um, requiring to be white bagged, um, and my colleague, Dr. Tu, will show you what that looks like, um, are, are, the, are drugs that are biologics. They require special handling. They're for people with chronic diseases, complex diseases, and um, oftentimes, most of them, require refrigeration. So the, uh, among the many, many challenges that we, we're seeing is the ability to ensure that those, those drugs are viable. If you just reflect back on those COVID vaccines, when we were receiving the COVID vaccines, there were multiple times that we had to quarantine them because the temperature tracking system within the box said that they weren't at the minus 70 degrees. I mean, we personally had to deal with that on more than one occasion. With these drugs, as you'll see, they come in a box. We don't know what temperature they've been stored at. There is no temperature tracking system in there. And we're trying to um, make sure we treat cancer patients and other patients like MS, multiple sclerosis patients in a timely manner. 
Um, one third of the country is under a heat wave. Two minutes are up. My time is up. Okay. Well, I, I did set the stage. Hi, President okay. O. This is uh, Jason in San Diego. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, could you please have uh, members of the public identify themselves? I didn't catch who that was. I'm sorry, my name is Rita Shane. I am Vice President and Chief Pharmacy Officer at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Thank you, Dr. Shane. Sorry, Jason. Any other public comment in Sacramento? Go ahead, yep. I thought that was... Oh no, that looks like lunch bag. I like that. Um, hi, my name is Ton Tu, and I am a pharmacist at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And um, thank you, Dr. Shane, for setting up the stage. And today I would like to use my two minutes to kind of demonstrate the process of white bagging from when the medication gets delivered to the hospital at a general loading dock to the patient when the patient comes for their appointment um, and get the infusion. So typically when a medication gets delivered to a hospital system, it comes to a, a, gen, a generic address. So for Cedars, it would be 8700 Beverly Boulevard. And it will come to a very general loading dock, and I have pictures in the uh, board material for you to reference. And so that box, um, it's usually very nonspecific. There's no indication that there's medications in there or storage condition that is required. So it could be sitting at a loading dock for hours before it gets to the right place to be stored properly. And when that medication gets to pharmacy, we would have to store it. And you can see here on my right, the white bags that would be required for all the patients that comes in for infusion. So at our medical center, there's a patient volume of at least 200 patients per day. And so when the patient comes in, we would have to sort through all these white bags to find that specific vial of medication that was sent for that specific patient, ensure that it's not expired and that it was stored correctly. And we would only know the storage condition from when it arrives at the medical center. We wouldn't know how it was shipped and things like that. And so that's a gap in this white bagging practice. And so after sorting through this, obviously when the patient comes for an infusion, usually the patient gets the same day clinical assessment. So if the patient's weight has changed or increased and the vial number of vials needed for that dose that day increased, the patient would have to be rescheduled for another appointment day so that we wait for the specialty pharmacy to send us another vial to QS the amount of vials that was already here. So for an underserved patient population in, in which patients may have transportation issues, rescheduling Two minutes is a barrier for patients. I apologize, the time. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Time. Can I ask a few questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Tu. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, so you described white bagging. How does that compare to how medications are delivered to your facility for other patients? Thank you so much. So typically for traditional buy and bill, the medications arrive at the hospital at a defined time. So like for say we get medications from McKesson, let's say there is certain time in a window that we would know the loading dock would receive shipment of the medication so that there's process in place. However, when patient specific medication gets to the hospital, it comes at random times of the day from FedEx, UPS or USPS and so the loading dock may be closed because loading docks at hospitals are not 24 seven. And so pharmacy staff like myself would have to track via, via FedEx to see when the medication gets there. And there is a patient example in the slide deck in which I had to go down to the loading dock, shift through all the deliveries that a medical center would receive to find that small package for the patient. So it's, it's outside of the normal workflow in which we handle medication delivery. So if I'm understanding you, uh, your general medication deliveries come through a different supply chain. These white bags come uh, through the mail system. So That's they're not correct. coming from medication supply chain. Correct. And then what do you do if you can't find it? Then we would have to contact a specialty pharmacy because we, the tracking and inventory is another issue mm -hmm. in which we have the patient schedule for appointments, let's say tomorrow. And so we have to manually track to make sure that the medications from 
all these different specialty pharmacy come. And if it's not, we would have to reschedule the patients and on the back end contact the specialty pharmacy to ensure delivery. We can't, we can't use our own supply stock so at the hospital. So you can't use your own supply to cover Correct. that? Correct. If it's going through the white bagging um, and, process. And what is the impact to the patient then? Um, patient delay, reschedule appointments. I have plenty of patient examples that we've shared previously in which patients would need to wait for the medications to come mm -hmm. before they can get the infusion. And it's a bit frustrating because we have all these medications already in stock at our hospital system that we cannot use for our patients. Is that clinically significant to the patient? I would say so, um, well, depending on their um, disease state, but a lot of these specialty medications are for advanced cancer treatment, complex diseases, osteoporosis. Um, so these patients require treatment, and it's not um, simple, you know, disease states in which delays are, are not impacted. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you, President, for the time. Thank you. Um... I also have a couple questions. Um, so you mentioned that the hospital can't use their stock of the medication. Is that due to in insurance coverage not covering it? That's correct. So with white bagging, um, the 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 health the health plans are requiring that the drugs be obtained through specialty pharmacy that are contracted, and so through that we would have to obtain the drug from the specified pharmacy in order for um, payment to be made. Thank you. And then the last question I have, um, you mentioned that because patients have to be monitored daily that there may be a dose change after a medication has been delivered. Does this create additional costs for the patient? Do they have to pay more than once or does that initial copay get eliminated for the patient if there is a change? From my understanding, the initial copay should cover it. However, because there is added complexity in which the hospital would wait for additional vials to be sent, that creates a uh, Time is, is money, right? So the patient would need to be rescheduled um, for another appointment slot to, to get their right dose. And a lot of the cancer treatments are weight-based dosing. Okay, thank you. So, so I just, I'm sorry, I don't like to do back and forth too much, but just, just understanding correctly, what if the white bag medication arrives late to the hospital? And, is the patient still going to have to be responsible for the copay on that medication? I mean, these are hundreds of thousands of dollars of medication. So, do they? Who pays for it? So, it'll, from my my understanding, that if the patients are ultimately going to get the treatment, the payments are not waived. Wow. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Actually, that that reminds me of one more thing. If if you do run into an issue where you've realized the medication. Um, is either lost or maybe wasn't stored correctly um, and it has to be resent. Does that cost go to the patient as well or is it, um, is there like, you know, I guess kind of going on to what Sung said, is that additional cost for the patient? To, to clarify your question is if the medication has to be sent twice, um, would the patient be responsible for the right. extra dose? Um, I, from my understanding, no. It would be just for the administration to the patient that one-time dose. But it does cause delays and, and significant time to coordinate with the specialty pharmacy to get extra doses sent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tu. All right, go ahead. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Desi Kodis. I'm the chief pharmacy executive at the University of California in San Francisco. And um, the University of California in total, we put a policy together, all of our campuses, to not allow uh, brown or white bagging uh, due to the concerns that you have uh, talked about, President O and, and others. Um, so we have a policy that we could only receive drug from our wholesaler or direct from the pharma manufacturer. So we have a lot of real world examples of delays, of expired men that was shipped, of increased hospital stays on a lot of these that we can pass out to you if you would like. But we really wanna ensure the patient's safety by limiting this ability of insurers to supply infused and injected medications through a third party vendor as was explained, like a specialty pharmacy. Health plans really bypass the health system 
checks and balances and limit our uh, nurses, our physicians, our other advanced providers, our pharmacists, the ability to assure safe acquisition and administration of these meds. So if you wouldn't mind, I would like to pass out some of these real world examples to all of you. We have plenty of these and we could send them remotely um, if you need to. Hi, this is Eileen Smiley, Board Council. If you could hand that to the staff because other people have not had an opportunity to review them and we can post them afterwards. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, question? Oh. Uh, right here, thank you. Okay. Uh, Maria Serpa, question. Um, you mentioned that your group of hospitals have a policy not to use brown bag or white bag medications. What does that mean to the patient? Does that mean that they have to go elsewhere they do, or they get charged the market rate and the insurance companies don't cover it? What specifically happens to the patient? They would have to, to go elsewhere and our own providers at University of California then could not treat the patient. So that's really difficult for patients who want to come to University of California for treatment. So they would need to go elsewhere for treatment. And if they choose to stay, would that be, they would be charged the entire amount they because they're be going no to, insurance? They would not be able to uh, stay and get treatment unless we were able to do it through free care and patient assistance, okay. which you. you know we have done as well, but they would not be able to get treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Ricardo? Any questions? Okay. All right, we have another public comment. Thank you. All right. Morning, board members. Um, my name is Ryan Stice. I'm a pharmacist in California. I'm also the vice president of pharmacy for Sutter Health. Um, Sutter Health is a not-for-profit healthcare system, uh, 24 hospitals, and we also, specifically for today, we operate 30 outpatient infusion centers. Uh, last year, we treated over 90,000 patients in our centers. Uh, many of those patients are coming to see us for cancer, for life-altering diseases, a very vulnerable population. Um, and they're coming to us monthly or more frequently. Um, you can only imagine if you extrapolate the 12 or 15 bags that were shown earlier, what that would be for 90,000 patients trying to coordinate the scheduling. Um, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, we chose as an organization to issue a policy uh, discouraging the use of white bagging. Uh, we're a large organization. We were able to implement that effectively. Uh, we reviewed SB 958 and issued a letter to uh, Senator Pan, uh, Dr. Pan, uh, in March in support of the bill. Um, and we did this largely to support smaller institutions that may not be able to um, withstand the practice being uh, pressed on them from outside. Um, I really encourage you to listen to the frontline uh, staff that see these patients every day, that experience and see the practical challenges that this practice creates and consider that in a motion to support SB 958. Um, I heard at the opening this, this board is about uh, consumer protection and I see this as a consumer protection issue. Um, I, I also want to touch briefly on the comments at the April board meeting about billions and billions of dollars in increased cost. Um, that's a, a very astounding statement, um, looked for references to support that, any sort of analysis and wasn't able to find that. Um, I, I think we can all agree that healthcare financing is incredibly complex, convoluted, uh, probably broken is a fair statement. Um, but to say that it will increase costs by billions and billions of dollars, I uh, did not find that to be supported. The Senate. Uh, Appropriations Committee assigned a cost to this bill of less than a million dollars. I, I apologize for the interruption, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sykes. Go ahead, Cola. Yeah, you started to touch on a, a question that I had. What is the um, opposition saying? And so you kind of touched on around cost. So is that the main thing that they're saying that if we um, uh, eliminate, you know, or had more limitations around white bagging, eliminate brown bagging, that um, costs would be astronomical to, to patients? That's what I heard previously stated, yes, um, which is interesting because we actually wrap our patients with financial navigation and uh, navigate them to grant programs, copay assistance programs. So when they're receiving the medication from our facilities, they're supported in access to uh, services that lower their out-of-pocket costs. 
Whereas in this model, that is shifted to the payer, to their specialty pharmacy, and we don't have visibility to how they're supported. Just to follow up, Dr. Seiss, um, the projected increased cost would eventually come to the patient. Is that because of the increased cost to the insurance companies first? Or is it the patient, um, at the end, the patient is at the end of the line. But is that where the um, most of the negative comments are coming from is from the insurance industry? Um, the previous speaker would probably be best to address that. Um, interestingly, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, just a few weeks ago, it was published an article called Your Money or Your Life. Um, and the, the thrust of the article was about the shift of your medication costs to your prescription benefit from your medical benefit. It gets confusing here, but generally the cost to the patient on the medical benefit side is favorable over what your out-of-pocket copays are when you go to your pharmacy, when you're, you're supported through a specialty pharmacy. Um, so from a patient perspective, this is generally a negative. Um, from the payer perspective, um, I think we're all aware of the, there's an FTC inquiry into PBMs currently around their practices uh, nationally. Um, the payers generally benefit when there is a rebate coming through um, for their, their interaction through the specialty pharmacy. It would probably take hours to explain that convoluted web, but <laughs> that will be uh, a whole day show, probably actually. Leave it there. Go ahead. Um, I did have a question about cost as well. Um, so you mentioned that Sutter Health provides a patient navigation program to assist patients with cost. So that's specific to your hospital, correct? Yes, our 30 outpatient infusion okay. centers. Um, so I guess the, the concern would be, and maybe you know if you're more familiar, it, at any, in any part of this bill, do you know if there's um, a part that addresses costs to make sure that patients aren't overcharged for these medications? Should they choose to go to a hospital or should the insurances require that? I don't recall that the bill addresses costs. I can speak okay. more to what we see day to day in practice and the impact of that shift to the prescription benefit. Yeah, I just, um, I ask just from, I mean, I don't have experience in the hospital at all, but I'm curious because I, I've noticed a trend, at least in retail, when we look at vaccinations, I have several patients whose vaccinations are not covered at all at their doctor's offices anymore. Um, so I was curious to see if there's a similar trend or if there would be um, with this. Okay. All right. So thank you, Dr. Sykes. Thank and then uh, we're going to go for public comment in San Diego. President O'Hite, this is Eileen Smiley, Board Council. And I know some people, the questions are um, quite helpful, but I think we also want to, we've heard so far with a lot of comment from the people who are obviously against white bagging um, that we exercise some flexibility for the public commenters who may not get questions from the board who are opposed to white bagging and this motion to give them also comparable time to express their opinions. Okay. All right. San Diego? Jason, I'm... Yes, we, San Diego is here. We have uh, two uh, members of the public that would like to testify. Okay. Hi, my name is Ashley Dalton. I'm the Associate Chief Pharmacy Officer for the University of California, San Diego. Uh, thank you for taking this valuable time to review the Senate bill. Um, as noted by my earlier colleague, um, Desi Cotis, UC San Diego favors this bill, is in support of this bill, and believes that payer-mandated white and brown bagging practices do not contribute to better patient care and place patient safety at risk. Um, I'd like to share, I know um, Desi passed out some examples, but I'd like to share some recent examples at UCSD. Um, I received, a, on a morning in May, I received a text message from one of my technicians at one of our infusion centers that she opened up a box that she believed to be medications delivered to our pharmacy and found a patient-specific prescription inside. It was a prescription for, um, that we weren't expecting. It was for two pre-filled syringes of Zolaire. Uh, again, we weren't expecting this shipment, and upon review of the patient's chart, the patient had been um, consistently receiving Zolaire at our infusion center through with medication provided by UCSD. There was no history of white bagging. Um, we called the pharmacy in question that sent the, patient, sent the medication um, and told them that the patient had received the medication here. 
they stated that uh, we could not send it back. <laughs> and, and if we did, it would have to be wasted and the patient would continue to be charged as well as the insurance company. We filed, we uh, went back and um, spoke with our authorization team. We saw that there was an authorization in place to receive the drug at our infusion center using UCSD product. We called the payer, um, stated the same thing. Um, after much debate and um, educating them on our policy at UCSD, they finally agreed to accept our product um, and we encouraged them to call the pharmacy um, so that the patient wouldn't be charged. Um, we did send the patient back, but again, this created a lot of unnecessary waste of time and medication on that part. Um, a second patient case uh, <laughs> to note is that one of our clinics submitted for authorization for a patient receiving Botox on the 10th of May. We followed up on the 13th uh, with the health plan about requiring about any authorization requirements. The health plan stated that they needed more time for processing. On the 19th, we called back. Uh, they said that it was still processing. On the 23rd, we were told that the, uh, by the authorization representative. I apologize for the interruption, but your two minutes has passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ashley. All right, James, any next comment? Yes, my name is Steve Gray. Uh, you've heard from me before on this subject. I would like to uh, reemphasize uh, that the Board of Pharmacy does have a responsibility to consider cost. If patients cannot afford coverage, if their employers cannot afford coverage, if their union trust funds cannot afford coverage, then they cannot afford the care or they have to go with a coverage that has very high deductibles and very high copayments. So it is a patient care uh, issue of the highest degree. Uh, this bill would uh, eliminate a very valuable part of how to control uh, health care costs, how to control drug costs. Those are high priorities at every level of government and is repeatedly one of the highest priorities of the public. It is probably one of, if not the highest priority of our governor. Uh, it would be important for the Board of Pharmacy to be able to say that they have done all that they can do before they support this bill. All of the vendors uh, that ha you have heard about that have made errors, mistakes, or problems are under the jurisdiction of the Board of Pharmacy. The Board of Pharmacy has jurisdiction over them as pharmacies. That's how they're described in the bill. Uh, not only them, but the pharmacy, but the PIC and the pharmacist. If they're making mistakes in packaging, if they're making mistakes in addressing, if they're delaying delivery, all of those, the Board of Pharmacy has specific authority to step in. However, I suspect, and in fact, I have been told that the Board of Pharmacy has received literally no or no significant number of complaints. Uh, these vendors have not been identified. No one has asked for the board's help. And in fact, in many cases, uh, the, uh, the PICs of the hospitals and those of the clinic have not reached out to the health plans. Uh, those pharmacies have a lot of motivation to, to keep those contracts. And there are literally uh, literally billions of dollars at stake. I speak from uh, 40 years of experience in which I was responsible for the uh, formulary processes and the uh, contracting and dis distribution for over 3 million Californians. And uh, I can tell you that this will raise costs dramatically. I suggest that the board needs to uh, oppose this, not go forward to support until it has a record of doing what it can to solve these problems before it uh, supports the elimination of a very, very valuable cost of coverage, cost of care uh, tool, and so forth. Uh, there has been some mistakes in the um, presentation so far. I'm open to all kinds of questions. It's very important for all the board members to fully understand it is a complicated process, but I'd be happy, happy to set things, some things that were set in error straight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Okay, we're gonna go for any other members there, Jason? No, President O, that is, uh, that's all of our public members here. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're gonna go for WebEx. All right, so the question and answer pencil, panel is available. If anyone wants to make a comment, please type comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it. 
to all panelists, or you may simply raise your hand. And we do have several hands raised as well as requests for comments. So we will start with uh, Melissa Chase. Uh, please remember that you have uh, two minutes. I'll give you a 10 second warning. And Melissa, you should be able to unmute yourself. Good morning. My name is Melissa Chase, and I'm the director of pharmacy for Valley Children's Healthcare, and I've been a practicing pharmacist for 22 years. It's my privilege this morning to address President O and our board members um, to make comments about Senate Bill 958 and the Medication and Patient Safety Act of 2022. Just to let you know, SB 958 would impose restrictions on health plans based on patient safety and doesn't eliminate white bag and brown bagging. It just simply adds requirements um, that hospitals use specialty pharmacies for certain medications or um, including infusion drugs. This requirement has negative implications for our patients and requires that Valley Children's commit extra resources to ensure patients receiving their life-saving medications in a timely manner. I'm here today to tell you a story about one of our patients named April. Um, that is not her real name um, for her um, privacy. The, to highlight how disruptive this practice can be, April is currently being treated at Valley Children's for Crohn's disease with an abscess in her bowel. After an initial hospital inpatient stay, April is discharged and continues with medication therapy. Six weeks after her discharge, her disease flares and April's doctor decided to start her on a drug called Remicade. After an initial denial from the health plan, the health plan eventually approves Remicade, but only for two doses from Valley Children's. April receives the two infusions in a safe and timely manner from Valley Children's Ambulatory Infusion Clinic. And then we submit a second authorization request to continue Remicade, but April's health plan requires that the medications now be white bagged, meaning that the drug will be shipped from a specialty pharmacy to Valley Children's. April arrives at our clinic for her third infusion, but the medication did not arrive in time from the specialty pharmacy, which this specialty pharmacy is located in New York State. So Valley Children's reschedules her appointment for 10 days later based on the specialty pharmacy needing time. Valley Children's orders Remicades again, waits for its arrival before scheduling- 10 seconds. Infusion. Finally, 24 weeks after discharge, April is scheduled for her fourth infusion, which has been significantly late, delayed due to white bagging. The entire time Valley Children's had Remicade on our shelves, but we were not allowed to use it for April due to the health plans white bagging. And the two minutes is up. Uh, we'll go to our next request for comment, which is from Ken Fukushima. And Ken, I'll let you know when you can unmute yourself. All right, Ken, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Ken Fukushima. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, so the smaller facilities and uh, they've also had the same problems as the larger facilities that, you know, just, it's just really tough on them. Um, and, it, you know, if we're, we're talking about protecting the public and I think that's the general concern of most of the small hospitals is protecting the public and, uh, and I agree with the, the rest of the advocates for this uh, bill. I think that's all I need to say. All right, our next request for comment is from uh, Rena Desay Patamala. So Rena, I'll let you know when you can unmute yourself. And unfortunately, I'm not seeing, uh, looks like Rena has dropped off. So um, we will go with our next raised hand, which is from a call-in user. So call-in user 707, you should be able to unmute yourself. Call-in user 4. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Dr. Erin Whitaker. I'm the outpatient pharmacy supervisor for Marshall Medical Center in Placerville. Um, we are a rural not-for-profit hospital and Marshall Medical supports Senate Bill 958 and I urge the Board of Pharmacy to do the same. I'd like to share a few patient experiences that illustrate the challenges with white bagging. I have a young man with a mental health disorder. He gets a bi-monthly injection of Depo-Risperidone to control his symptoms. 
Upon exam mid-month, the patient was assessed and determined he needed an increase in his dose. Due to the patient having a white bag medication, the physician had to resend its prescription, wait for the processing time, and reschedule the patient for a week later for the increased dose. This was wasted medication of the patient for half of his month and, and was a delay in his care while he was symptomatic. I have another patient who is a long-term white bag patient for over a year. She reports that she's had major issues throughout the process, requiring her to call monthly to arrange for the deliveries. In February, her medication was delivered after hours to our pharmacy. I'm sorry, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so her medication was delivered after hours. It was left at the front desk and not refrigerated. This required us to have to coordinate for a reshipment of her medication. Um, and we were not allowed to coordinate that. The patient had to because the prescription was coming from a third party pharmacy. I also have a young patient who's been on multiple white bag medications for over five years. She reports care delays and taking 15 to 30 minutes of her time every month to call and have to arrange for the medication. Her prescription's over $100 a month and she has to obtain a copay assistance card to be able to afford this. And the two minutes are up, so we're going, uh, Rena has rejoined us. So Rena, you should be able to unmute yourself. And Rena, you should be seeing a prompt to unmute yourself. We'll give it one more try. Rena, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go, you're unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, good, um, good morning, my name is Rena Patrawala. I am the clinical manager for oncology pharmacy services at the Scripps Health MD Anderson Cancer Center Network in San Diego County. Um, I've completed uh, two years of a post-grad residency, including oncology specialty training. Um, I've been a board certified oncology pharmacist for nine years and have been a practicing oncology pharmacy specialist for over 22 years in four different states. Um, just to give us a little background, um, Scripps Health is actually um, a mid-sized to small size integrated health delivery network. We treat about 5,000 cancer patients per year in our ambulatory infusion areas. And of these patients, close to 1,000 or 20% are currently impacted by payer mandated white bagging. As a direct result of patients being mandated to acquire medications through, the, through these third parties, we have seen and felt numerous repercussions which have impacted the safe and timely delivery of life-saving chemotherapy to patients. Um, so the issues as we see them uh, are three large ones. Um, in patients with cancer, the time it takes from diagnosis to treatment will determine outcome. The longer it takes for patients to receive treatment, the lower their chances for improved survival and cure. Introducing a third party for medication acquisition in a highly specialized and high risk um, area such as chemotherapy dispensing causes delays in treatment due to unpredictability of supply, um, as well as unpredictable and, um, some of the other um, drug integrity issues that some of the other commenters have already commented on. Issue number two, in order to safely administer chemotherapy, patients must also have guaranteed access to supportive care medications such as hematologic recovery, growth factors, nausea vomiting medications, and bone modifying agents to name a few. Again, timely access to these medications is often complicated by a high burden of patient costs, so out of pocket seconds. costs. Um, and, and we see this issue all the time. Um, and the last issue is you know, the in inherent unpredictability when patients are mandated by a payer to use a third party causes significant disruptions to and those uh, two minutes are up. The uh, next request for comment is from Lori Hensek. And Lori, I'll let you know when you can unmute yourself. So Lori, you should see a prompt to unmute yourself. Great, I just wanna make sure that you can all hear me. Yes. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, my name is Lori Hensick. I'm the Corporate Director of Medication Safety, Risk, and Compliance at Scripps Health in San Diego, the same health institute where Rena um, Petrolli um, is from. On behalf of Scripps Health, I respectfully urge you to please support SB 958, which would prevent third party payer practices that are currently jeopardizing the health and safety of our patients by restricting their access to critical medications. Um, I, I would like to echo my colleagues um, and all of the prior presenters' um, concerns regarding, you know, the disruption to quality control protocols, medication integrity, and I did also want to piggyback a little bit more on some of the discussion surrounding the financial impact and financial toxicity that this um, that these practices causes. So that I'm not reiterating some additional talking points. Um, we've received a lot of white bag medications that the patient is no longer taking or has expired, these medications cannot be returned, nor can they be used for another patient, resulting in a large amount of medication waste. While white bagging may appear to present an initial cost savings to health plans, the real costs resulting from delayed patient care and disease progression, as well as planned payments and patient co-pays spent on the medications that are unable to be used and facility expenses to destroying medications that are unable to be used completely outweigh any savings to the overall healthcare system. For example, health plans pay approximately $3 million a year to Scripps for, fight for white bag medications dispensed for Scripps patients. Additionally, these patients must pay out of, pay, out of cockpit, excuse me, out of pocket co-pays for these medications, which range from, range from $5 to $1,500 per dose. However, 12 to 15 to as many as 20% of these medications are ultimately unable to be administered to the patient after having Ten been seconds. Dispensed due to the challenges with white bagging, resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medications discarded each year due to the complexity of this process. So I, again, just would like And the two minutes are up. Our next request for comment is from Mark Johnson. And Mark Johnston, I'll let you know when you can unmute yourself. All right, Mark, you should be able to unmute yourself. And Mark, it looks like your audio is through your phone, so you might have to unmute yourself a second time, both on the phone and on your computer. All right, Mark Johnston, I'll, we'll give it one more try. You should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll move on to the next request for comment, which is from Dan Kudo. Oh, Mark Johnson, you're unmuted. Oh, you were unmuted. Now you're not. You're muted again. Give it one more try. Mark Johnston, you should be able to unmute yourself. And you're unmuted. Can you hear me this time? Yes. Thank you. This is Mark Johnson with CVS Health, and I stand in support of Steve, Dray's, Steve Gray's comments. Um, America is in a healthcare crisis based upon cost. Simply put, hospitals bill significantly more for the same product, which is why insured entities choose to save through the use of weight bagging. Decreased costs equate to increased distribution and use, increasing public safety. Yes, this is an inconvenience to hospitals who need to develop an organized method to deal with incoming shipments so they are not left on a shipping dock or on the front desk unrefrigerated and to develop an organized method to administer to patients. Understanding this, the Virginia Board of Pharmacy promulgated basic rules to increase communication between pharmacies and hospitals, which appears to have solved the issue without the many parameters of this bill that appear to be inappropriate for the board to take a position on without the statutory authority to address hospital and pharmacy profitability. There is no DQSA issue here, period. The pack out science for mailing is independently certified. Absurdly, there should not be a restriction on REMS drugs. In fact, proposed rules in Nevada specifically support wet white bagging of REMS drugs. I urge you not to take a position on this bill based upon inconveniences resistance to change and anecdotes, not scientific data. Thank you very much. All right, and our next request for comment is from Dan Kudo. Dan, you should be able to unmute yourself.
And Dan Kudo, you should be able to unmute yourself. We'll try that again. There you go. You're unmuted. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, President Owen, distinguished members of the Board of Pharmacy. My name is Dan Kudo. Uh, by introduction, I have been a pharmacist for 47 years. I'm currently president elect of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists. I speak in favor of SB 958. I believe the issue is simple and my insights to you will be consistent with the principles we stand for as healthcare professionals. We are trusted by the public we serve to ensure the safe and efficacious use of medications. I believe that the words are important because they define who we are. When doctors graduate from medical school, the oath that they take the first part of it is first, do no harm. Pharmacy students swear an oath. I will I will consider the welfare and humanity um, and relief of suffering as my primary concern and swear I will embrace and advocate change that improves healthcare. Finally, the mission of the Board of Pharmacy is straightforward. The Board of Pharmacy protects and promotes the health and safety of Californians. The board has been provided with several examples of how the practice of white bagging is associated with delays in care. Imagine yourself in a hospital gown. Uh, we favor a system that might be associated with delays. Uh, would we favor a system that might be associated with delays in therapy, the outcomes uh, in question? And so I'll leave with this comment. First, do no harm. Thank you for your kind consideration. All right, the next comment is from Keith uh, Yoshizuka. And Keith, I'll let you know when you can unmute yourself. So uh, Keith, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you for the opportunity. Keith Yoshizuka, uh, speaking as an individual, uh, I've heard the uh, comments that others have put forth and I speak in favor of uh, advancing this bill to restrict um, white bagging, uh, both for the safety of the patients and for the uh, uh, continuity of, of care uh, for the patients that we serve. Thank you for your time. All right, and John Grubbs is next. John, you're in, you should be able to unmute yourself. John Grubbs, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go, you're unmuted. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, thank you for taking up this issue today. And Mr. President, I really appreciate your uh, motion to support this bill. My name is John Grubbs. I'm the Chief Pharmacy Officer for University of California Health. University of California Health represents the six uh, University of California Medical Centers. Previous speakers have done an excellent job outlining the numerous patient safety concerns with the practice of white bagging. And it's for that, for those reasons that the University of California has taken a position to support Senate Bill 958. So I look forward to um, hearing further debate and hoping that the board takes a support position on this bill. Thank you so much. And our next request for comment is from Rita Ju. Rita, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, President O and board members. My name is Rita Ju. I am the president of the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. And I really do want to thank the board with consideration of Senate Bill 958 and would like to speak in support of the bill. And specifically, I would like to reiterate some of the safety concerns with the practice of white bagging. First, um, when there is a need to change the medication doses for, for the, after the medication has been shipped, for example, if there is a change in dose based on an increase in the patient's weight for a medication that requires weight bait dosing, and this is especially affecting the vulnerable pediatric patient population. There may not be enough medication sent to the site, which will then 
result in either underdosing of a patient or a delay in therapy. Secondly, is the concern with the authenticity and integrity of medications uh, pharm the pharmacy will receive. There is a lack of supply chain or transport oversight, especially with co-chained products, which many of these white bagging medications require co-chain um, storage. So the integrity of the medication cannot be guaranteed. And it also, this process, the white bagging practice also makes compliance to the federal DSCS. SA regulation very difficult, if not impossible. And thirdly, the medications provided by the pharmacy may be supplied in different concentrations of formulations from the institutional standard medication inventory. This means that the product will not be built in the CPOE and pharmacy system and can lead to, at best, confusion of what is being administered to the patient, but it certainly could lead to the confusion can lead to dosing errors, which could be an unknown overdose. And lastly, is really the operational challenge of the inventory management system that can cause confusion and eventually medication errors. Thank you for your time. All right. And the next request for comment is uh, from. Oh, sorry. Can, can we ask the question of Dr. Ju? Is she still there? She is. Let me uh, give her the permission to unmute herself again. Just a moment. All right, Rita, you should be able to unmute yourself again. Yes, I did. Great. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ju. This is Maria Serpa. You'd mentioned uh, different concentrations may come from the white bag versus what's normally carried in the pharmacy, and you, you use some jargon. Maybe you can explain just a bit more of what that means to when you said CPOE, computer systems. Does that mean that uh, alarms and alerts would not go through because it would be built as a non-formulary item? Or what does it specifically mean to patient safety? Um, thank you for the question. Yes, um, there are a, a, quite a few different layers in this. First of all, if the medication, um, the specific strength of the medication is not built in, that could potentially be when a pharmacist received the medication and did not realize that there is a ch difference in the strength of the medication and just enter the order that, that way that could lead to under or overdosing depending on what strength, whether dose, the strength is higher or lower. And if the formulation is not in, in the computer system for ordering or for, for uh, pharmacy verification, then all of the safety checks from dosing, drug interaction, allergies and all will not be in place and now you're re relying on a manual check from the pharmacist to, to know that there may be potential safe, safety issues that is not, uh, they're, they're not alerted by the computer system, which they, when they're so used to that, trying to stop your process and rethink in a manual way is very difficult and is very error prone. Great, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. All right, and the next request for uh, public comment is from Candace Fawn. So Candace, I'll let you know when you can unmute yourself. All right, Candace Fawn, you should be able to unmute yourself. I'll and Can Candace, Candace yeah. you are unmuted. Can I am unmuted, correct? Correct, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Thank you to the board. Good morning, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Candace Fong, and I'm System Vice President for Medication Safety for Common Spirit Health. We are the parent corporation, the umbrella corporation to Dignity Health. Uh, also, by the way, we cover 21 states, but I actually happen to be one of your 40 year plus uh, pharmacists for California. So uh, thank you for acknowledging that. Um, I won't go over the specifics of the examples because I think previous to uh, the previous speakers had addressed all of those. I did want to speak as on behalf of the organization that we are in support of this bill. We uh, have had many uh, examples across uh, the 21 states, but 
pursuant to California, we've had many different examples. And uh, one I want to make of note is we are focused on patient care and patient safety. Um, we have one hospital that is in a bit of a remote area and has challenges during bad weather, but they have uh, managed to provide care to their patient because of the community and the remoteness. And we've actually calculated the expense that the organization has gone to in hundreds of thousands of dollars, but with a commitment to support those patients. So it truly is focusing on the patient and the safety of these medications. So I'll just close with that and in support of uh, the bill. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator and I see no further requests for public comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you, Trisha. I really appreciate it. And thank sure. you for all the comments. Okay, so um, with the motion and second on the floor and with the public comment received, um, I'm going to maintain my motion, but just wanted to confirm if members had any comments or thoughts. Okay, we're ready for a vote. So we're gonna go for the vote. Starting with uh, Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Jesse, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Jesse. Jose, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Kula, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Kula. Ricardo, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Thank you, Ricardo. Jason, I, you, go ahead. To avoid any appearance of a conflict Thank of interest, I will abstain. Thank you, Jason, and I vote yes. The motion passes. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry uh, for shuffling things around and we'll take a quick break, uh, just 10 minute break. So we'll come back at 1115 with uh, our petitions back on track. Thank you, everyone. Your Honor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, do we have Mr. or Dr. Weiss back? Because I don't see a camera on that end. Hi, Your Honor. I'm just a civilian. Mr. is fine. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Okay. So if there's nothing else, we will go on the record. Okay. All right, Your Honor, would you like me to take a roll call? Uh, let me first just state that we are okay. on the record before the Board of Pharmacy, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California. Now, President O, could we please have a roll call? Sure, okay, Maria Serpa. Maria Serpa, present licensee member. Thank you, Maria. Jesse Crowley. Jesse Crowley, present licensee member. Thank you, Jose de la Paz. Jose de la Paz, present member of the public. Thank you. Kula Koenig. Kula Koenig, present member of the public. Thank you. Ricardo Sanchez. Yeah, Ricardo Sanchez, public member. Thank you, Ricardo. And Jason? Jason Weiss, public member. Thank you, Jason. And I am here. Back to you, Your Honor. Thank you, President O. Oh, I see that a quorum of the board is present. My name is Jessica Wall. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter. We are presently discussing the matter of the petition for early termination of probation filed by Dr. Ronald Lee, agency case number 6277-OAH case number 202206020211. May I please take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Good morning. I'm Deputy Attorney General Nicole Trauma. I'm appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California under Government Code Section 11522. Thank you, Ms. Trauma. May I please have the petitioner state and spell his name for the record? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ronald Lee. First name spelled R O N A L D. That name Lee spelled L Y. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So, th this proceeding is concerned with your rehabilitation since license discipline. The DAG, Ms. Trauma, will first present your petition package and provide a background in this matter. After that, you'll have an opportunity to make your presentation. I'd like to remind you that the board has had the benefit of reviewing your petition packet, so you do not need to restate any of the items within that packet. 
After today's hearing, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. You will not receive a decision today. It will be mailed in the future. Do you have any questions about that, Dr. Lee? Uh, no, I don't, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Trauma, could you please present the petition summary? Thank you, Your Honor. We're here today on a petition for early termination of probation. The underlying accusation was based on petitioner's conviction on July 26, 2017 for driving with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08% or more. The court certified the BAC at 0.27%, which is a little over three times the legal limit. The accusation alleged conviction of a substantially related crime, use of alcohol in a dangerous manner, and unprofessional conduct. Effective March 21st, 2019, petitioner's license was revoked, the revocation was stayed, and he was placed on probation for four years. He's been compliant with the terms of his probation, including reporting on a quarterly basis. He's paid costs. He's paid his probation monitoring costs. He's participated and continues to participate in the Pharmacist Recovery Program, or PRP, has participated in random drug screening, has abstained from the use of drugs and alcohol, and practices under the supervision of a licensed pharmacist not on probation. Petitioner is requesting to terminate probation early. With the instant petition, he submitted continuing education certificates taken from April 2020 through March 2022, submitted eight letters of recommendation, all of which have been verified, and he submitted a personal statement. I now like to mark as Exhibit 1 the petition packet, which includes all of the documents I just described, as well as the notice of hearing and the memorandum to the board and the underlying decision in order. The board members and the petitioner have been provided with a copy of the same set of exhibits, and the redacted petition has been uploaded to the OAH system and Bates labeled AGO001 through AGO166. I request that Exhibit 1 be admitted and that the court issue a protective order as to documents Bates labeled AGO22 through AGO66. Um, these contain confidential records relating to petitioner's substance abuse treatment, and I would like to have those sealed from the public record. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trauma. Dr. Lee, I'd like to ask at this time if you object to admission of your petition packet into evidence. I do not object, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibit 1 is admitted for all purposes. I will also grant the protective order addressing pages 22 to 66. Thank you. So, at this time, Dr. Lee, this is your opportunity to make your presentation. As I mentioned before, you don't need to restate the items in your petition packet. You just want to tell the board why you filed your petition and why you believe it should be granted. Before you do so, I need to swear you in so I can consider your testimony under oath. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Thank you. You may begin. So, uh, good morning, Your Honor, uh, Mr. President, and honorable board. Um, Pharmacy board members. Uh, my name is Ronald Lee. I'm a pharmacist for CVS, and I would like to start off by sincerely thanking you for your time, giving me the opportunity today to be heard for my petition for early termination of my probation. It was it was almost six years ago um, to the day that um, that my life had forever changed. On June 9th of 2016, I was arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. During that time, I was going through a very difficult, a very difficult divorce, um, and that I learned my youngest daughter, who was just four months old at the time, was uh, was diagnosed with an untreatable rare genetic disorder called neurofibromatosis type one. Not knowing what to do, I uh, I ultimately and unfortunately turned alcohol more turned to alcohol more and more to help me numb the pain and cope with a sadness that I couldn't control. Um, even worse, I made the decision to drive while under the influence. I could have lost my life that night, could have been injured or even killed innocent people that was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm extremely grateful that that didn't happen. I'm, I'm tremendously remorseful that I put the public at risk and I deeply regret my decision. As I came to my senses, I knew that my life had become unmanageable 
alcohol was having a, dev a devastating impact on my life. My BAC was a 0.27%, and I knew I needed to seek treatment and get my life back on track. I voluntarily sought treatment at Stillwater Recovery at Hold Hospital in Newport Beach in September of 2016, and I successfully completed the 30-day residential treatment as well as one year aftercare. Effective March 21st of 2019, my license was revoked, stayed, placed on probation for four years because I was convicted of a crime substantially related to the qualifications, duties, and functional performances. I had used alcoholic beverages to the extent or in a manner as to be dangerous to myself or the public, and I was ordered, I was also ordered to participate in the pharmacist recovery program in Excuse me, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, I just this is the moderator and apparently the board is having a hard time hearing the petitioner because the paper you're, you're holding is blocking your microphone somehow. Oh, I'm sorry. So is that, I'm, is that I, better? Um, we'll let the board, um, let, let, let us know that. And I do want to echo that because this is being electronically recorded as opposed to a court reporter. It's really important that you speak loudly, slowly, and clearly into your microphone because the audio I hear is what's making that recording. And if I can't hear you that clearly, then our transcript will not be as clear. So just make sure to take extra care with that. Thank you. Is is this better? Is this better? It is on my end. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll I'll go ahead and continue uh, with my statement. Uh, I truly deserve the board's decision on the discipline imposed on my license, and I understand my tissue will not be granted lightly. However, today I would like to address and answer any questions about the extensive efforts I've taken and, when, and will continue to take in my rehabilitation since the, since the decision. And I'm happy to say that it's been over six years since I've had alcohol. My personal sober date is 6 10 of 2016, so that would be six years and six days to be exact. To continue my commitment to recovery, I also finished a six weeks professional treatment program and one year aftercare at Betty Ford Center at the recommendation of Maximus. From treatment, I continued to learn to practice the principle of the 12 steps. Honesty, hope, faith, courage, integrity, willingness, humility, love, discipline, perseverance, spiritual awareness, and service. I've learned to identify my triggers, pray and meditate to my higher power, be willing to ask for help, made amends with everyone I've hurt, develop healthy coping skills, and reflect on my past alcohol use to decrease denial, and practice recovery behaviors and integrate those into my daily life. Treatment also helped me develop a strong relapse prevention plan and improve my own support system to hold me accountable to my commitment to my sobriety. The AA community and working the 12 steps with my sponsor has definitely given me a renewed sense of purpose, a new light, and shine a light into what I considered the darkest chapter I've ever experienced. Being of service to the community keeps me grounded and has been instrumental to my own recovery. Currently, I attend five AA meetings every week. I'm an active volunteer at the Dream Center in Los Angeles. I'm a key speaker for CBS in our Pharmacist Teach program. It's called Dose of Knowledge, where we address substances, substance misuse, and educate students to make good decisions for the health and well-being of themselves and their community. I'm also after Easter Seals, and I'm a member of Hogue's Heroes, the alumni organization for Stonewall Recovery at a Hogue Hospital, where, where I return to help facilitate groups and sit in on Q&A alumni panels, share my story, and offer hope to new residents and patients seeking treatment for chemical dependency. Professionally, I've completed over 130 hours of continuing education uh, focused on substance abuse, pharmacy law and ethics, and regulatory compliance. I've also been certified as a substance abuse specialty pharmacist, where I've enhanced my knowledge and skills needed to identify and discuss common substances of abuse. From this, I've been able to improve my competency in providing guidelines for common prescription opioid medications and distinguish between overuse and withdrawal symptoms. I work with multiple treatment centers in the area surrounding my pharmacy 
And because we're a 24 hour store, I've been able to streamline my pharmacy to be the pharmacy of choice to dispense much needed detox medications to many of the new patients coming in from John Wayne Airport to these treatment centers. I was also honored to be chosen by my superiors to lead the fight against COVID-19 to coordinate the vaccinations to thousands of Americans in our community. And in, in 2020, um, my district leader, my region director, and my fellow colleagues voted me to win the Regional Paragon Award in CVS, which I'm extremely proud of and humbled by. Drawing from my experience as a recovering alcoholic and being a single father to an ill child really changed the way I practice. I've learned to be more genuine, empathetic, and compassionate to my patients, which has made me a better pharmacist in so many ways and has made my career much more fulfilling. My work performance has been outstanding as noted by the support letters written by Dr. Panera Pot my worksite monitor and the pharmacist in charge of my pharmacy, as well as from Neela Patel, my district leader. And due to my result, due to the results of my work performance over the years, I was actually offered to be promoted to district leader. However, the terms of my probation will not allow that. I wish to be granted early termination from, proba from probation and maxim because professionally, I hope to accept the district, the district leadership position and get my career back on track. I believe in this leadership role. I can draw from my experience as a recovering alcoholic, a single father to an ill child, to impact so many more of my CVS colleagues to embrace their jobs as healthcare providers. Really making an effort to change the stigma around substance abuse and be more empathetic to these patients. The pharmacy is usually the last stop after a visit to the doctor's office. If we make these patients feel just a little better by practicing with patience, kindness, and genuine caring, then we did our job. Personally, personally being on probation and in Maximus while working full time as a single father um, has, been, has been extremely hard, uh, both on my time commitment to my two daughters, as well as the financial burden of Maximus. My daily schedule is extremely rigid. I have no flexibility uh, really to spend any more time with my two girls and it's even more challenging when one of them is a special needs child. Being granted early release from probation and Maximus would allow me to have some flexi flexibility back to spend many more days with them, be a better father by having more time to care for the needs and make up for the times lost when I wasn't able to see them. Also being able to travel is difficult while on probation and Maximus. Both my parents are getting up there in age. Um, you know, I feel like the pandemic really expedited that. And I hope to travel with them along with my two girls um, as their health is starting to decline and soon would prevent them from traveling with us. Lastly, if granted early termination, I will without a doubt continue going to AA meetings and continue my volunteer work to service the community. Giving back to the community is a, is a value I love. I would love to instill my daughters when they're old enough and that they will grow up to be proud of their father one day. Recovery is a lifelong process and I will be part of the AA community for the rest of my life. I am also ready and looking forward to be a sponsor to a newcomer to work the 12 steps next time. In summary, I hope that the board will review my letter to recommendation uh, my clinical evaluations for my psychotherapist and my addiction physician and other rehabilitative documents in detail and see that I put in an enormous amount of effort into my recovery and my rehabilitation and that I'm not I'm no longer a risk for relapse and that I no longer pose a threat to the general public. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And before I allow Ms. Trauma to ask you some questions, I'd like to check is the board able to hear Dr. Lee okay, or do we need to further address audio issues? No, I think we're okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, Ms. Trauma, would you please begin your questions? Thank you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Ms. Trauma. You, uh, you talked about your DUI conviction and your testimony. How do you feel about that conviction now, looking back on it? You know, um, I. It's a blessing in disguise, this trauma. Um, I believe that if I didn't suffer from any consequences, 
um, just due to my heavy drinking during that period of my life. Um, you know, I don't know where the end would have been, but but in hindsight, um, it, it was really it, it was a it was a real big wake up call, and it saved my life. And you've complied with all the terms and conditions of your criminal probation, correct? Uh, yes. And um, I understand from your testimony and from your um, petition that you intended that you participated in a chemical dependency program in 2016 at Hogue. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and that was inpatient. That was just uh, 30 days inpatient and one year after care. Yeah. Did that program require you to abstain from alcohol and controlled substances? Um, no. Just alcohol. Well, when I was when I was in there, it was yeah, it was no control substance or alcohol. When I was in the program, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah. why did you have to abstain from both control substances and alcohol if your issue was alcohol? Um, I believe. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I think that that was just really like the guidelines for the treatment centers was that. There would be no control of any mind altering drugs or um, if I remember correctly, bad, bad old. Is that something, uh, a theme that you've seen in the other recovery programs you've participated in? Yeah, yeah, unless there's, I mean, unless there was a, like a written prescription or for the, for the need for the control substances, that would be okay. But in general, there would be no mind altering drugs or alcohol. I see. Is that possibly because they don't want you to substitute one mind altering substance for another? That's correct. Okay. When was your first interaction with the PRP? It was, I believe, in April of 2019. When you first went to PRP, did you find yeah. it April of 2019? Yeah, right around there. Okay. When you first went into PRP, did you find it difficult to admit that your substance abuse disorder had made your life unmanageable? No, no, because I knew I knew that before already. Okay. In your petition, you stated that you didn't disclose all of the controlled substances you were taking when you first started the PRP program and that it resulted in a positive hair test and violation of probation. What controlled substances are you referring to? Um, so I was prescribed um, Adderall, um, Rutalbital for my headaches, and then I had a the winter that winter of 2018, if I remember correctly, I was prescribed um, antibiotic preventolin and promethazine coating for for bronchitis. Were you also taking tramadol? That was a, that was actually after um, that was actually after I got into PRP. Um, I, I injured my, my, my front right tooth and I lost it. So I had, I had a, a dentist prescribe that for me, but I was under the assumption that as long as I had a written prescription for it, it would be okay, but I didn't disclose it to PRP. So that's why. And why didn't you disclose that? Um, I wasn't, that was just a bad judgment, you know, an error on my part. I should, I should, I definitely should have. Did they ask you to disclose all controlled substances that you were taking? They did. Okay. Um, so, as a result of that positive test, your license was suspended for six months and you were sent to the Betty Ford Clinic. Is that right? That's correct. It was yeah. suspended. Yeah, it was suspended for right about, I believe, six months. Okay. And you completed the Betty Ford program. Is that in August of 2019? August of 2019, that's correct. Okay. And um, did you find anything uh, useful in that program? And if so, what? Um, no, definitely. Um, it really reinforced my, my commitment to recovery. And one of the character defects that, um, that I really that I really worked on at, that, at the Betty Ford Center that really helped me out was um, transparency and honesty um, and asking for help. Um, those were two um, character defects that um, that I struggled with um, by after the Betty Ford Center um, and just being able to talk about it um, has really made that a lot better 
easier for me to make. So I I saw on your records from the Betty Ford um, program that you had denied successfully using alcohol except on rare occasions predating your DUI. But then I also saw that you reported to your doctor at Superior Family Medical that you were drinking um, up to a bottle of wine per day. So can you tell us, were you in fact drinking excessively on more than rare occasions prior to your DUI? Um, no, prior, like maybe like a month leading up to my DUI, I was drinking pretty excessively. I'm not sure where that information came from, but yeah, but it was, it was predating my DUI, I was drinking pretty excessively as well. Okay. With everything leading up to it. Um, was that positive hair test uh, wake up call at all for you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, have you have you had any positive tests for alcohol while participating in PRP? No, I have not. And um, you have a sponsor? Yes, I do. How often do you meet with your sponsor? Um, about two to four times a week. Um, he lives pretty close by. Um, and I've known him since 2017. We've grown to be pretty close. So if I don't, if I don't see him, we're always texting each other or calling each other. And you attend AA? Yes, five times a week. Right. Do you see yourself continuing to attend to attend AA at that frequency? Yes. And do you work the steps? Yes, I do. I've worked it. Um, I've worked it multiple times um, with my sponsor. Um, and I find it useful because every time we rework the steps, I, I probably worked them maybe five times with him. Um, and it's just, it's gone. I mean, it, it's for me, the steps has been very beneficial to the both of us actually, because it's like really in different phases of our lives. Um, you know, the steps, the steps mean, you know, different things. Um, and I'm sorry, I missed your date of sobriety. Can you tell that to me again, please? Yeah, my um, my personal sober date is 6 10 of 2016. And does that include, uh, is that that's just from alcohol, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Do you have a separate sobriety date with regard to controlled substances? Yeah, for, from that, um, my, for my program date for Maximus, I believe is in May of 2019. Okay, um, <clears throat> I understand from your petition that your daughter's illness was a stress factor for you. Is that yeah. still now a stress factor for you? Um, it's actually gone a lot better. Um, she's six years old now. Um, she's meeting all of her milestones. Her, her, uh, milestone, so um, she gets quarterly checkups at Child Children's Hospital in Orange. Um, and so far, so good. Um, we're just hoping that She's going to come out with a very mild case of the diagnosis, but we won't know that until she's right on 10 years old. And what about the, um, I know I understand from your petition that the divorce may have been a trigger for you. Yeah. Yeah. How's your relationship was, now? You know, it's, it's grown so much, um, over the last 6 years. I feel like we did reconnect on so many different levels. Um, and my ex, you know, she's, she's my number one supporter and I really appreciate that. Um, so that's really helped us become better co-parents and partners. And we agree to each other that no matter what happens, um, you know, the safety and the well-being of the girls is going to be always our number one priority, putting our differences aside. So how would you say that you cope with stressful triggers now? Um, now, I, I used to be very impulsive. Um, so, I, you know, my sponsor once told me, um, you know, you would want to respond instead of react. So, um, you know, I, I run every single day before work, um, five days a week, actually. Um, and that's just a way for me to just meditate, um, just go through my gratitude list, um, you know, and being with my girls, you know, that therapy in itself. And just talking to my sponsor, 
Um, and also, I meet once a week with my um, psychotherapist, Mark Carell. Um, um, so that really helps as well. So I have a lot of um, you know, systems in place to, to help me. And I, I understand from your petition that you're looking to apply for a district manager position. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I would hope so one day. Once you get off probation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With such a promotion will inevitably come stress and a great deal of responsibility, right? Yeah, yeah, but I'm, um, you know, back in 2016 when I was kind of going through everything, um, I didn't really have a foundation to deal with life on life's terms. Um, everything just kind of hit me at once, um, a divorce, um, you know, my, my daughter and then my DUI, it, it all happened within like a three month span. So that was just really hard for me, um, you know, but now um, I'm, in, I'm in a much better place. Um, and, you know, just reaching out to my resources, my support system, if I ever have a bad day at work, um, they're, they're literally just a phone call away. And, you know, like I mentioned before, one of my character defects was my unwillingness to ask for help. But the last three years has really helped me turn that from a defect into a strength. Now, um, with regard to the PRP program, um, okay. have you completed that yet? Um, no, I'm actually um, I'm waiting to get into transition, I'm almost there. Um, and right now, um, I am at zero percent supervision um, with daily review. Okay. So, have you applied then for the transition phase of PRP? No, not yet. I have. Um, I have. Before I could apply for um, transition phase, um, I have to. Um, I, I was. I was asked to go over my steps. Um, the twelve steps and write a brief section summary on each step, and I was able to do two per month. So I'm up to my last step in the first of July. So I have one more step to go. Okay. And then, do you have to receive approval from your recovery evaluation committee to petition for transition? Um. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the okay from my case manager, um, and from Ed. Yeah. I understand. So, what is yeah. the, the purpose of the transition phase? The purpose of the transition phase, um, there's a lot, I guess there's a lot less restrictions. Um, you're going to be going to um, just randomly drug tests. Um, you can still report, um, do a quarter report every quarter to maximus. Um, still have a worksite monitor. And you don't have to go to AA meetings, by, but like I mentioned before, I, I intend to continue to go. And that's the difference. Okay. Would you uh, agree that it provides the participant an opportunity to demonstrate that they can safely practice without so much oversight? Oh, yeah. Yes. Do you think it's an important phase of the program? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Do you think you'd benefit from going through the transition phase? Yeah. And how long is the transition phase, if you know? I believe it's for one year. I believe so. So, if the board terminates your probation, the PRP program will no longer be mandatory. Is that your understanding? Um, I believe, yeah, I believe so. So, why should the board not require you to finish the PRP program through to the end and do the transition phase? Um, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, I believe my my, my hope is um, really to have my probation terminated um, or grant early termination of it. Um, but I mean, I don't mind finishing the maximus really because I'm almost there. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Trauma. President Oh, would you mind polling the board members for questions? Not at all. I'm, I'm actually going to start with uh, Dr. Crawley. Dr. Crawley, go ahead. Hello, um, thank you so much for meeting with us today. I first of all want to commend you for your outstanding um, work over the last several years in your effort in sobriety, but also your contribution contributions to your community. Um, it's really rare to see how invested 
community pharmacists can be in controlled substances with their communities. So really just want to recognize how amazing that accomplishment is. And if I remember correctly, I think the Paragon Award is normally um, given to pharmacy managers. Is that correct? Do you know that? Um, that's correct. Yeah, that's that, that's correct. But but um, my region chose me. I wasn't pharmacy manager at the time. So I, I think that's um, another thing to just recognize is, yeah. you know, your company has acknowledged your accomplishments, even though you aren't manager right now, but they've they noticed how much you're contributing to your community. Um, so one of the questions is kind of a follow up to what one that was already asked and, you know, as a district manager, sometimes the schedule can be a bit chaotic and at times you may be on call. So how do you plan to adapt your um, your rehab prevention plan to make sure that you're staying sober and that you're staying um, on meetings, going to your AA meetings and keeping your sessions with your therapy. Are there any changes that you will be making should you be promoted? You know, if, um, if anything, um, well, thank you for your question, by the way. Um, if anything, the district manager position would actually allow my schedule to be a little more flexible. Um, then, you know, working a shift today um, as a staff pharmacist, um, you know, there's there's going to be periods, I guess, where there's a tremendous amount of work or things coming coming on my way. But the way I set up my schedule right now is I'm always attending. I, I always wake up at five in the morning, um, you know, and, and check and check to see if I need to be drug tested. Um, and then I do my my AA meetings at night at nine. Great. I don't have any other questions. Um, you should just be proud of yourself. That's the last thing that I want to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Mr. Jose de La Paz. I have no questions at this time, Mr. President. Thank you, Jose. Kula, do you have any questions? No questions. Just echo the sentiments about, um, you know, being proud of yourself and really putting in the work. Thank you, Kula. Thank you. Ricardo, any comments, questions? Just um, wanted to congratulate him on uh, getting his life back. Uh, having two daughters is a big accomplishment, and being single, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, I see you, you know, you've done a great job in the last uh, eight, I guess, eight years, or no, six years, six days, I believe. And um, just want to applaud you for that, for, you know, moving forward. And I uh, just want you to know that uh, here at the pharmaceutical board, we do believe in redemption. And um, I, I like what I see as far as uh, how you uh, acknowledge your, you know, um, having the DUI and also what you've done to better yourself on it by taking the AA um, program. And, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, shows us that uh, you're on the right path. I want to say thank you for coming before us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, Jason? Hi, Dr. Lee. Really, thank you uh, for appearing before the board today and congratulations on the hard work you've done in, in your uh, long term of sobriety. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you Dr. Maria Serpa? Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your time. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank I you. have just one question. I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, on the completing of PRP program, did I miss that you are not, you have not completed that yet, correct? That's, cor that's correct. Okay. And obviously, I think the uh, DAG trauma did kind of ask, but just to confirm, if we were to grant you an early termination, will you complete that program? Absolutely, yes. Okay, and um, also to continue to attend AA, correct? That's correct. Okay, um, just no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Dr. Lee, I would like to confirm my understanding that there are no additional documents you'd wish to present today? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. And do you have any witnesses you intend to call? Um, no, it was just me, Your Honor. 
Thank you, Dr. Lee. So, if there's anything else that you would like to know the board to know before you conclude your petition, now is the time. Um, nothing else. Thank you for everyone's time today. I sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So that concludes the petition hearing in this matter. The case is submitted and the record is closed. We are off the record in this matter and we'll proceed to the next petition. Thank you. Your Honor, I'm sorry to disrupt again the flow, but we are going to take a lunch now. Uh, as I'm sure you expected, it is 11.54. We'll come back at, on about 45 minutes, so we'll do 12.50, 12. 12 Stop. Oh. When, 12.30. Is it okay we go one more petition then? Okay, all right. We'll go with one more petition before lunch then, and we will proceed. Never mind me, and we will proceed to next petitioner. Back to you. Okay, thank you. Which, oh, um, is it Dr. Chalikias? Could you please pronounce your name for me? Uh, Chalikias. Chalikias, okay, thank you. Let me get the recording up for that. Okay. I apologize, it just takes a moment with these electronic recorders. Okay. We are on the record before the Board of Pharmacy, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California, in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation filed by Christina Chilikias, agency case number 6371-OAH case number 2022060220. My name is Jessica Wall. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter. A quorum of the Board of Pharmacy is present. May I please take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Good morning. I'm Deputy Attorney General Nicole Trauma. I'm appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California under Government Code Section 11522. Thank you, Ms. Trauma. And Ms. Chalikius, could you please state and spell your name for the record? Sure. Christina is my first name, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A, last name Chalikias, C-H-A-L-I-K-I-A-S. Thank you, Ms. Chalikias. So, in this matter, the board is concerned with your rehabilitation since your license was disciplined. First, Ms. Trauma will present the petition packet and a summary of the background in this matter. After that, you'll have an opportunity to make your presentation. I'd like to remind you that the board has had the benefit of reviewing your petition, so you do not need to restate the matters contained within it. After the um, after you present your testimony, Ms. Trauma will ask you some questions, followed by the board members. After the hearing, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. You will not receive a decision today. You will receive it in the mail in the future. Do you have any questions, Dr. Trilegius? Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. So, Ms. Trauma, could you please present the petition summary? Yes, we're here today on a petition for an early termination of probation. The underlying accusation alleged that petitioner violated laws and regulations governing the practice, practice of pharmacy while acting as the pharmacist in charge at Fusion IV Pharmaceutical doing business as Axia Pharmaceutical. The accusation alleged misbranding of compounded preparations, imitation of another drug, prohibited acts, purchase, trading, selling, or transferring of misbranded drugs, failure to have a master formula prior to compounding, compounding of a commercially available product, failure to support the beyond use date assigned, failure to have compounding records, and failure to have complete compounding um, records. Uh, effective September 26, 2019, petitioner's pharmacist license was revoked. The revocation was stayed. She was placed on probation for three years. She's been compliant with the terms of her probation, including reporting on a quarterly basis, has paid costs, has paid probation monitoring costs, completed remedial education, completed ethics course, and completed the or complied with the term that she not own any licensed premises. Her probation was told for approximately five months for not meeting the minimum working requirement from October 2019 to January 2020, and then in July 2021. 
petitioner is requesting to terminate her probation early. With her instant petition, she has submitted continuing education certificates, submitted five letters of recommendation, all have been verified. She submitted a personal statement. I'd now like to mark as Exhibit 1 the petition packet, which includes those documents, as well as the notice of hearing and the memorandum to the board, the underlying decision. The board members and petitioner have been provided with a copy of the same set of exhibits. The redacted petition was uploaded to the OAH system and base labeled AGO001 through AGO144. Request that Exhibit 1 be admitted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trauma. Dr. Chiakis, do you have any objection to admission of Exhibit 1 into evidence? No. Thank you. Exhibit 1 will be admitted for all purposes. Um, so, Ms. Chiakis, let me let me try again. Am I mispronouncing your name? No worries. It's Chalikias. Chalikias. I apologize for that. So, Dr. Chalikias. I need to swear you in before we can consider your testimony as evidence. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Thank you, Dr. Chalikias. So at this time, it is your opportunity to tell the board why you filed your petition and why you believe it should be granted. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, good afternoon to everyone who's um, joining the meeting today and thank you so much for um, considering my petition of early termination of probation. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. So, is that okay? So, can you hear me? Okay. so my name is Christina Chalikias. Um, I graduated pharmacy school in Germany in 2008 and have worked there as a PAC for two years um, before moving to Los Angeles in 2010. Being a pharmacist has always been my passion, um, helping others and providing highest patient care. Therefore, I applied for my foreign pharmacist degree in 2011. Four exams and 1,500 intern hours later, I obtained my California pharmacist license. I was so proud and excited. It was quite difficult to find an intern position back then. I had worked part-time at a retail pharmacy and part-time at Fusion RX, later Fusion IV Axia. Since Navid Vahedi, the owner of the pharmacy, wasn't willing to pay um, me for those intern hours initially, I started volunteering. I was so eager and passionate that I accepted his offer. After a few months, he started appreciating my hard work and then decided to hire me as a pharmacist after obtaining my license in 2013. He sponsored me for a working visa, which allowed me to work in the US, but solely for Fusion RX. When Mr. Vahedi expanded the business and opened another pharmacy for sterile compounding only, he asked me if I wanted to become PIC. I accepted the offer a few months later. Early 2017, he approached me and the manager of quality insurance with a request to start compounding so seconitide injectable. Um, at that time, um, it was a commercially available drug that was um, not on the FDA shortage list. So I had mentioned my concerns that the injectable was not listed, but he explained that some physicians try to order through the manufacturer without success. He had those physicians sign an affidavit and he insisted on compounding. I went on maternity leave in August 2017 and was not present when the Board of Pharmacy inspected Fusion IV. I was never fully informed about the inspection, about emails the board had addressed to me and only found out later when reviewing the discovery CD related to the accusation. When I came back in 2018, I received the accusation via mail in September. After receiving and fully understanding the accusation sent by the Board of Pharmacy and learning about the board's denial of Fusion IV's attempt to receive 503B license, I was in shock. I had never intended to do anything against the law. I consulted with the company's lawyer and reached out to the Board of Pharmacy and decided to quit my position as principal pharmacist and to leave Fusion IV a few weeks later. There was no other option, although I knew uh, was not allowed to work for any other employer. I had a lot of time reflecting on what had happened, and especially during the, during the ethics course, things became very clear to me. A lot of different factors had an influence on my wrongdoing. 
Codependence has played a significant part. Nabil Vahedi sponsored my work visa and wasn't able to and I wasn't able to work for any other employer within the US at the time. Fortunately, I am now holding a green card and I'm independent. I'm actively observing myself and uh, to for uh, sorry, sorry, to assure independent judgment in my daily work life without codependence. I always wanted to please people, especially my employer, and but I'm now making compliance to pharmacy law and patient safety a priority. Avoiding dual relationship and saying no, speaking up to physicians as well as to employers has been a process for me to be learned. I have learned to analyze my professional acting and judgment so that I now am able to recognize when boundaries are about to be crossed and how to protect myself from working unethically. I watch out for warning signs and intervene right away. From a compliance point of view, I am documenting my work in more detail. For example, when I'm consulting with a physician or patient, I make detailed notes on what has been said. I triple check my work and research intensively before making a decision. I keep boundaries with patients physicians and employers and say no when appropriate. The medical ethics course has been very helpful. Both days have deepened and strengthened my knowledge in compliance and laws. I was also able to gain plenty of new knowledge about the various laws and regulations applicable to the duties and responsibilities of a pharmacist. The protection plan at the end of the two day class was made motivational and helped to structure professional and personal life moving forward. Personally, I think being trustworthy and putting the patient's needs health as first priority is one of the most important ethical codes. As a pharmacist, you are responsible for the patient's well-being. I need to make sure he or she is getting the most appropriate and safest medication therapy. I must be honest at all times, communicate with all involved parties of medication therapy, and build a relationship with the patient in which he or she can trust me. It is crucial that I take responsibility for what I've done. If you don't think it is your fault, you will never be able to regret and repair. Taking responsibility and regretting my violation will give me the chance to repair. It takes a lot of time to reflect and pursue changes, but this process is the only way to seek forgiveness. When I started working at Complete Infusion Care in 2020, I initially volunteered working as a clinical pharmacist. The company was looking for a pharmacist in charge, and since I was not able to fill that position, I offered to come in as a volunteer. I was eager to, back to, my, to get back to my profession. I love my work, and providing service to patients in need has always been a major part in my life. After my license was put on probation, it was very difficult to find an employer who was willing to give me a second chance. I had volunteered in the past at the Venice Family Clinic, a nonprofit organization for homeless and low income people, and knew how important it was to give back to the community and people in need. When the COVID pandemic hit the world in March 2020, I volunteered right away to obtain my immunization certificate. I have had the strong intention of being a part in helping to end this pandemic. Giving COVID-19 vaccines to the public and saving people from death, this meant a lot to me. Based on the foregoing, I would like to point out that I take full responsibility on my wrongdoing that occurred in 2017. I did not intend at any given time to do anything non-compliant with state or federal laws. Patient care and safety has always been my highest priority. I learned a lot during my probation how to identify risk factors to triple check my work and rather use my own judgment than relying on others. I am not the pharmacist anymore. I was back in 2017 and then therefore asked the board to grant my petition for early termination of probation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chalikias. I'm now gonna have Ms. Trauma ask you some questions. Sure. Good afternoon. Now, Good afternoon. you were the pharmacist in charge at Fusion, is that correct? That's correct. What was the time period that you were acting as the pharmacist in charge there? 
Mm, so I started the position in June 2016. Um, then I became pregnant with my second child. Um, I did then go on maternity leave in 2007 in August, uh, but did, I don't know why I made the mistake that I did not um, with that position, we did not file for interim um, PIC. So I was still the PIC. Then when the board came into the inspect, we didn't make the change. And then I think I went back to be PIC in February 2018. And then with that position, I don't remember exactly, it was like in 2018 before I left, because there was a transition where the, we were, the sterile compounding pharmacy was transitioning to a 503B outsourcing facility. And looking back, there was a lot of confusion about that. So, um, and that at that point, you don't, there is no PSC needed anymore. So not exactly sure on the date in 2018. Okay. Now there were six causes for discipline against you. Most of those related to compounding violations, right? Mm -hmm. There were violations for not having support for the beyond used date that were assigned to non sterile to sterile preparations, correct? Correct. And there were also violations for not having in product testing for sterility and monitoring of acceptable levels of pyrogens prior, prior to dispensing, correct? Uh, that I'm not aware of because I know that some. Um... Some mentioned, um, sorry, the compounding, some of the compounding was happening when I was on maternity leave. And, yes. but I don't, uh, that I don't recall um, because, yeah, I know there were issues when I was gone, but um, I'm not aware of, of the releasing of products without sterility testing. Okay. What's the importance of having a beyond use date that is supported by suitable integrity and stability studies? Oh, it is important because you want to make sure that the, first of all, you need to make sure that the medication is sterile and then you need to guarantee that it's stable as well. So without having any data, you don't know for how long the medication is stable for. So how could those types of compounding violations potentially harm consumers? So if the stability study is not in place, then, um, you can definitely have the risk that the patient, the medication is not active anymore at the moment the patient is using it or the doctor's office in that case. Yeah, since it was the, um, I guess back then, since it was the copy of a brand product, um, the, the quality, we, we were like a team of quality and, you know, the owner, so I, I'm, I just think back then maybe that was the case that because it was a brand and that we basically imitated it since they, you know, they said that the doctor can't get the patient, sorry, the doctor's office is not able to get it. So um, I guess um, it was assumed what was definitely wrong that it has that stability. So you mentioned in your testimony that you had concerns and that you addressed those concerns with um another pharmacist that was working yes with. that's correct okay yeah. because i knew at the time that we were not able to compound something that's not on the fda short list if it's a brand product so when we had that meeting i said i think we shouldn't be compounding this is not on the fda shortage list but then the owner and that was my mistake he said that different doctors reached out to him they would try to get the medication but they weren't able to and that we still need to make it. And I guess there was a shortage, but not of that specific file size. I don't, yeah, there were a lot of different information. So, but I definitely learned that I should not rely on somebody else telling me something. I definitely need to do my own research. I have to, um, I'm responsible on making that decision. And that's definitely what, what was my fault and that, what I deeply regret today. So how would you handle a situation like that now if an owner of a pharmacy is telling you, no, this is okay, we can do this, but you're... No, I wouldn't, I, 
I definitely would insist on it's not on the list and the FDA shortage list. We can maybe reach out because, you know, sometimes there's delay in reporting shortages. So I could intensively research that, but um, yeah, at the time I should have resigned from that position because we were not agreeing and we were basically, he was not supporting my decisions. So I should have resigned back then from the PIC position. Now you were required to take compounding coursework as part of your probation, correct? Yes, that's correct. And do you feel like you learned anything from that coursework? Oh, yes, I did a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of updates, as you know, especially when it comes to hazardous compounding, different kinds of, you know, um, compound, sterile compounding. So I definitely learned a lot during those classes, um, also up getting updated on the current laws. Um, I do currently not work in compounding anymore, so it um, doesn't apply at the moment, but I did definitely benefit from those classes. Okay. You stated in your petition that you now make compliance to pharmacy law and patient safety a priority in your practice. What sort of steps do you take now to ensure compliance with pharmacy law and patient safety that you feel like you may not have focused on in the past? Yeah, so um, I intensely research, you know, when there's something that I'm not exactly sure about. Um, I researched and I'm lucky at um, one of the positions that I'm currently at. We have a comp um, compliance pharmacist who I can also reach out to and she, who is very knowledgeable as well. And I also had the pleasure to get a lot of um, support from the board, from my board inspector. So um, if I'm not exact, not 100 percent sure, I don't do it. And, you know, and then I definitely use resources to find out what's the right thing to do. Now, you also had to take um, some education related to what it means to be a pharmacist in charge. Is that right? That's correct. And what did you learn from that? I learned that you are, the PSC is responsible um, no matter what, no matter when. I mean, back then I was also working part time. So um, that was something that I had to learn as well um, since I, I didn't oversee all of the operations. And especially when I went on maternity leave, I wasn't able to to see what was going on at the pharmacy. So this is something I learned that no matter what happens, and even if it's, you didn't do anything, but you know your technician did something, it's your responsibility, and there's no no um, questions asked, and you have to make sure that everyone at any given time is compliant at the pharmacy. Knowing what you know now. Um, do you feel like you were prepared to take on that role as pharmacist in charge at Fusion? No, no, not at all. I mean, I don't, I don't want to use it as an excuse, but also maybe also coming from a different country, you know, it's always, it was a switch and it was my first position here. I worked very, for a very long time with Fusion. It was like eight years. So I did my intern hours there, then they hired me and gave me that opportunity. So I never seen any other setting here in the United States. So I was definitely not prepared for that. Do you ever see yourself becoming a pharmacist in charge again? Not at the moment, no. no. It's just, as I said, being responsible for everything at any given time, especially when you don't work full time, it's just a responsibility that, um, yeah, it's a big responsibility and you need to be aware of that. Do you believe that the board's probation program has made you a better practitioner? Yes, definitely. As I mentioned earlier, the ethics class was like a game changer for me. That it was a really op eye opener because it helped me to see me from a different angle. And also not look just at the professional life, also look at personal life and see what has led to what I've done. And to now be aware of that and then apply it for the future. That was that was a huge help. And my last question, why do you want to terminate your probation? So, first of all, um, I was in a similar situation that I applied for several jobs. And I always, my always um, goal was to work in a hospital setting, do more clinical work. So, I have had a lot of interviews. Also, already before I went on probation, but I informed everyone when I knew I was going on probation. And when it comes to that last step, especially with corporations, um, there is no way um, to to be hired for that position. So that's something I'm really looking forward to 
have other opportunities and um, increase my experience. And then secondly, I also had the experience with volunteer work that I um, I applied for a lot of, the, um, signed up at different websites. I was um, applying for like um, vaccination, as a vaccination pharmacist, as a volunteer, but um, that was also limited. I could, um, and I don't know, nobody ever told me, but I, I can, I would love to do more of that as well. And I hope with being off probation that people are more less hesitant to have someone help. I understand. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trauma. President O, could you please poll the board members about their questions? Sure, thank you. Uh, we're going to go with Jose. Jose, do you have any questions for? Yeah, uh, thank you. I do have a question. Now, at any point, did you feel vulnerable when you were raising concerns to the owner? And you know, did you feel you would lose your work visas or sponsorship if you pushed back on the owner? That's a good question. I mean, I never pushed it that far. To, to totally, yeah, but he was very insistent on what he had in mind and what he wanted to be done. So, and I, yeah, I only had worked for him. He was sponsored me. So there was some independent, uh, sorry, some dependence and always that feeling inside of me that I thought I have to pay back in some way. So I would raise my voice, but then my mistake was I didn't follow up, you know, through I, when it came to the final. Saying I should have said I'm not, not doing it, but I, yeah, he was very, very demanding sometimes and insisting on that he wanted to be done what he asked for. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Jose. And we're going to go to Kula. No questions. Thank you, Kula. Uh, Ricardo, any questions for? Chill, chill. Sorry, Charlie Aki. Charlie Kia. Thank you. Yes, I just yes. want to say thank you for coming before the board um, and basically sharing your struggles to get your license back or getting back on good graces. Um, takes a lot of uh, courage. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. All right. Jason, any questions or comments? Hi, Dr. Telekias. I do want to say thank you. I know it's difficult to appear before the board, so thank you for doing that and for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maria Serpa, any comments, questions? Yes, just one, qu one question. Thank you, uh, Ms. Telekias. Um, you are almost finished with your current probation, if I calculate that correctly, including your tolling. So there's less than a year left, if that's correct, um, if you can confirm that. And as to yes. um, why you are requesting uh, now, what would this offer you um, to have your, um, your probation uh, terminated early? Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's correct. It is less than a year. Um, I have applied for different positions and I was, um, Actually, the, earlier this year I was very close to um, getting into um, a little more clinical position that I was denied at the end because the last step, uh, like agreeing of the corporation manager, um, did fail. So I'm looking forward to get more interviews going. And like as I said, I would always wanted to work like in a hospital setting, do more clinical work. Um, compounding was something that I learn more intensively coming over. It was not like that what, uh, area I really wanted to be in. So now I'm excited to explore different opportunities and um, yeah, just looking for other opportunities. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jessica Crowley. Hello, thank you for um, coming in front of us today. I know this isn't easy. Um, and it seems like you really do have some self-awareness and you've re reflected on, you know, some of the, the things that you didn't stand up for before. So I commend you on that. Um, just an area of clarification. I 
thought I saw in the petition that you were hoping to get a home infusion position. Is that not accurate or do you have an area in pharmacy that you're looking to explore? Yes, so I am doing a home infusion specialty pharmacy. Um, but just continuing that in a different setting. So, being, a you know, in a hospital setting, doing like the parental nutrition, all this. Um, kind of medication and, um, yeah, but it's true. Home infusion is a part of it. Perfect. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Just have a 1 question 1 clarification. I think um, I think you guys talked about it, but like, what was, how long was your involvement with your owner? How long was it that you've known him? Oh, I, so I started my intern hours with him. That was in 2012, early 2012. And then where I was with him until October, 2018. That's when I quit the position. 2018. Yeah. Okay. So and you quit six and a half years. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was compounding something that you want to go back to, or I think I'm hearing that it's probably not. No, not for now. I mean, I did it for okay. a very long time, and I learned a lot also, especially now with all the remedial education classes. And, and I think I'm pretty up to date with all the current laws that are um, related to compounding, but I miss the patient interaction. You know, it was a lot of lab work making sterile medication. There was not too much of um, patient okay. care involved. So I, I I did not like that part of compounding. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate your time. Back to you, Your Honor. Thank you for listening. Thank you, President O. Dr. Uh, Chilikius. I'd like to confirm on the record that there's no additional documents you'd like to include in your petition. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. And do you have any witnesses other than yourself today? No, I do not. Thank you. So at this time, if there's anything else you'd like the board to know when considering your petition, now is the time. Um, I'm good. I just want to thank everyone to listening. Give me the opportunity to explain what has happened back in 2017. Um, I really appreciate being here and um, sharing my thoughts and my recovery and like what has I have been through in order to um, be a better pharmacist and making uh, wiser decisions, not depending on others. So I just want to thank everyone for your time and consideration. Thank you, Dr. Chilikias. That concludes the petition hearing in this matter. The case is submitted and the record is closed. We are off the record in this matter. And I believe that we'll be Thank doing you. lunch break now, President. Oh, sure, yes. To... Let's do lunch. It's 1225. So we'll come back at 115, 115.